maybe while we refer to, let me ask uh, by a show of hands, I'd like to get a sense for like how much you feel you already know the bigger funnel. Anyway, I feel we have a range of experience. So let me let's calibrate this. So let's say one is I don't believe it, it's all hype, but I'm gonna look like willing to hear it. Five is like I'm training policies right now. And three is like, um, you know, I've trained maybe one or two of the variants, but I'd like to hear a sort of the catalog. So raise your, raise your hand, show, show me one finger to five fingers. Okay. <laughs> Good. Two people are training policies right now. Okay. <laughs> so there was a very broad distribution, uh, which is of course a challenge for me, but that's all good. Oh, we're good? Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, so welcome to the supervised policy learning for real robots tutorial. I want to thank my in particular for sort of uh, the inspiration to do this and organizing the bulk of it. Uh, and Siwan, who's actually the visa that he comes through, so he's back in Cambridge right now. Mm -hmm. He's a, a very hands-on expert uh, at TRI on some of these things. I'll do my best to represent him. And we're right, thank you. So. Uh, the plan for today, we'll start off with an introduction. I'll try to talk about some of the background, some of the different sort of, how do I think about the taxonomy of these methods? And I'll give you a little bit of opinionated uh, stance on where I think we are, what we think, what we, think we need to do. I would love it to be interactive. So uh, um, please just fire questions. We have microphones around. So that could, I mean, probably if you shout it out, it's okay. But if we need to run The goal is to be uh, people asking, so we decided not to write expect everybody to open up their laptop and code, but Mahi does have some um, some codes that will run along with the <coughs> examples that we'll be able to write afterwards, and we'll have a few links throughout the slides that will sort of help you get going. Okay, so uh, I will uh, be unable to say BC in your clothing for most of the day, so I uh, apologize, supervised policy learning is approximately the same as we just in my mind. Let's just make sure uh, that we sort of categorize it. Uh, I, I think that there are being two main disciplines to, for imitation learning, one of them being behavior modeling and the other inverse reinforcement. Okay, how does that work? Okay. We'll okay. Classic fail. Okay. All right. So there's sort of two major approaches to imitation learning where behavior cloning, where you're actually just doing supervised learning to go from, let's say, observations directly to actions would be the simplest definition is one of those two sort of dominant. And that's the, the main topic for today. Somehow here we go. So the main topic here is about behavior cloning of sort of end to end uh, visual motor policies. And we're going to, we're all biased a little bit towards manipulation. So that'll be the main focus. Uh, but I'm happy, we're happy to sort of talk about applications in other domains. Of course, it has a long history, right? So um, uh, you could pick your favorite place to credit first, but certainly Alvin was one of the, the earliest examples of doing end-to-end -end driving with a neural network uh, uh, directly trained from pixels to roughly pixels to torque. Okay, so we shouldn't think of this as something that just happened. We should think of this as a, an old idea. Um, of course, it has rich connections to RL and control, even if you only care about uh, RL, uh, I think it's still very relevant. So you see, for instance, in one of our classic success stories in RL, uh, the first step in AlphaGo, not AlphaZero, they've eventually replaced it, but the thing that got everything off the ground to start with in the original uh, AlphaGo paper was actually doing behavior cloning from human experts. And that was enough to get it to sort of a, a decent level of play, but not championship level of play. And then it was the self-play on top of that that got us to sort of master championship level, okay? And I wouldn't be surprised if we see something similar play out in the manipulation space, okay? Uh, <clears throat> of course, if you're in RL and you're training state-based feedback policies and simulation because it's faster or it works better, and then you're distilling your state-based feedback policy to, to an output feedback-based policy, that's gonna be very, that's basically using the tools of behavior cloning. But of course, maybe with some extra interaction and, and dealing with the distribution shift a little differently. And even, uh, I would say, offline RL has really rich connections to behavior cloning. And we, we actually heard that in one of the talks this week, 
uh, the graph retrieval, search and retrieval talk made an explicit comment that offline RL is often weighted behavior cloning. Okay, so there's lots of connections to be made, even if you don't love behavior cloning just for the sake of behavior cloning. So this is kind of the points I want to land in this first session. Okay, so behavior cloning is working surprisingly well. I think we know that you were, that's why you came, right? It's enabling robots to do tasks that were impossible just a few years ago, at least in my uh, my measure of it, but not at a hundred percent success rate, right? And even the ninety percent, it's kind of an arbitrary. That's the numbers that we like to we like to see, but that's heavily dependent on the complexity of the task, the diversity of the rollouts, right? You could make that look higher or lower, but I think uh, my my uh, sort of conscience is clean if I say ninety percent uh, right now. I think that's a pretty faithful a sense of our best skills and hard work. I think a few key lessons and architectures have emerged in the last few years where there's some, some, some amount of consolidation in the, in the field. And that's one of the goals today is to try to sort of spell that out. There's also a lot of, I'd say folk wisdom, and we'll try to give you some of that too. And please feel free to ask questions. <clears throat> um, I say, we don't still, com still don't completely understand the basics. That's maybe I should just say, I don't, cause I can't speak for you, but um, I feel that there's as much as things are working, there are very basic things that I feel we should understand and we don't. Uh, I think the type of understanding, I mean, I come from more of a controls and, and optimization background, and I don't think we'll have the same type of understanding in BC and super in learning as we will have of those, but even our rigorous empirical understanding of these tools is not where I think it, it could be. And I'll try to I'll speak to that as we go. I think rigorous evaluations will help as a field. We haven't really uh, locked that in yet. We'll talk about that. And um, and I really want to encourage you that there's just tons of open basic research questions yet. This is not like, you know, download the fav your favorite uh, repo and you're, you're done. Uh, you should, I in fact, if anything, I think it's opening up a whole bunch of new questions but I think it does take, I don't think the field has fully articulated those questions yet. So I, I think that we're in kind of a, a transition phase for the field where we have to work a lot to even just articulate the new questions that have started. Okay, good. So let's dive in a little bit. Uh, I don't really probably have to show the highlight reel, but there's just tons of things that behavior cloning is working uh, incredibly well with from the Google robots, the RT series, RoboAgent is another great example. Uh, you know, Laurel and Mahi have been pushing on uh, a consistent series of in, uh, improvements to behavior cloning with their particular emphasis being out in the wild, doing this in, you know, real homes and, and things like this. That's a, a beautiful emphasis that they uh, have really leaned into. We've been working on diffusion policy a lot at TRI, which does, um, you know, some of the more dexterous tasks surprisingly well. For me, that this was one of the moments where I uh, changed my perspective on, on these, was starting to see how well the diffusion policy could work on, on the tasks I cared about. Uh, you saw this week the UMI. You maybe saw it when Chung blasted it on Twitter, but uh, uh, right, it's just like shockingly cool. I was very unhappy, by the way. He said, um, are the grippers waterproof? I said, no, the grippers are not waterproof. You know, And then he showed me this video like a week later. I'm like, come on. <laughs> uh, but but it, he didn't break it. Uh, so. I would never have done that experiment. <laughs> I'm too conservative. Uh, of course, Aloha has done just absolutely incredible things, right? So you've probably seen the Aloha Unleashed, right? Just, I think the questions about whether this work can, can do sort of fine-grained manipulation and really dexterous tasks, I think that question has been, you know, beautifully answered. And we've seen the mobile Aloha, you know, making shrimp in Stanford kitchens and the like, right? So. It's just incredible what these things have been doing. Uh, the The reason I put this one in, of course, is that the humanoid companies are starting to show behavior cloning results and the motions are just so beautiful and smooth on that robot, right? Uh, you know, just, just gorgeous, right? So people who worry about inference speed and other things in, you know, can we do it at high rates? Uh, that's pretty smooth, right? I don't know the details of how they did it, but I've seen increasingly people for that particular project. I've seen increasingly people doing a lot of nice work, making uh, things run fast. And then you see like, uh, you know, snapshots of like the Tesla, you know, laboratories where there's just teams of people teleoperating humanoids all day long, right? 
we have a bit of that going on at TRI, maybe not at the same scale. Okay, so, I mean, you guys have probably seen those, that's why you're here. Let's talk about um, why is behavior cloning interesting? Why do I like it? Why is it somehow the topic today at 20, in RSS 2024? Um, I'll, I'll start with a story, right? So I was sitting next to Justin and company at, at, the, at the banquet just the other day, and someone comes up to me and he says, Russ, you know about controls. What the hell? <laughs> He said, like, you don't really believe in this end-to-end -end stuff, do you? Um, and I get that a lot these days. Like, you know, have you sold your soul? Like, uh, you know, uh, right? So I feel, uh, I guess, a responsibility to explain myself, you know, because I get those kind of questions. And um, so let me tell you my reasons. You might have different reasons, okay? But the first one, without question, and the first thing that uh, convinced me was doing direct high-rate control directly from RGB. Like we've been able to do things with, you know, with depth and and explicit estimation, but this is like straight from pixels. I would say that the model-based tools that I've worked with over the years have never had a direct answer to that. And in particular, the ability to do it without any explicit online state estimation, not even an explicit state representation, right? Uh, no explicit dynamics model. This seems like um, naivety in some, in some ways. Okay, but in terms of deploying things uh, and the amount of assumptions you need on the real world, it's much less, right? And the examples that I was using, you know, years ago to try to say controls has a problem, like what is the state space of the onion and is it splitting every time the knife goes through, right? What's the state space for this? What is my model for this? And how do I write a perception system for that? You know, I was, we were talking about this for years. This is actually one of the reasons I switched to manipulation was because I felt that the problem of sort of output feedback was so important for locomotion too, but we were, it was, it took examples like this to sort of give up on state estimation as a crutch. Okay, so in my mind, the original vision, visual motor policies that, you know, started using all the modern tools that happened in 2016 with Sergey and Chelsea and, and company, right? And at the time it was just a pre-trained ResNet, um, attacking your robot sensors and a MLP, uh, multi-layer perceptor on output. But just to make that point land, the key thing that is different is that there's no explicit state representation. This intermediate representation that comes out of perception is just some latent vector Z. I think this is you know commonly understood these days, but that's a big deal. It means you didn't have to impose a state representation on the world and, uh, and we get some, some uh, anti-fragility because of it. And even in that original work, which was, this was the guided policy search work. So it was actually a little bit more like distillation at the time, but it was making sort of surprisingly dexterous things running from RGB on real robots. Like this incredibly good. I was super impressed when I saw that, but it didn't, I wasn't quite sure what to make of it. Maybe the same stance that some of you, you know, have, uh, have now is just like, do I, should I, can I believe what I've been seeing, right? Um, for me, uh, we started doing work on it in 2019 or so. Uh, I had some students, Pete and Lucas, some of you know them, right, um, that started to do visual motor policy learning in, in our lab, and they started showing these results that just changed my mind. I was just, by the end of that project, I was a different person. I could not believe how robust to occlusions. I, I just expected fragility everywhere, but, but you, could, you could mess with this robot uh, and, and really it just did surprisingly good things for, at the time, somewhat simple, simple tasks, but all directly from RGB. There was no explicit state estimation, no explicit depth, use of depth. There was a little use of depth in one part of that, but. Okay. And it started working, of course, on, on things that I would have had a hard time modeling, right? So a deformable hat, right? Uh, you know things that are uh, distractors, occluders, but also physical changes in the environment that would have been hard to model and, and hard to be explicitly robust to. So for me, that was the big change. And it was very simple, right? It, it was just a mouse interface at the time. Pete would sit there flipping shoes or whatever the task was, you know, 200 times or something like that. And then he'd play it out. And I was still suspicious. I still am suspicious. And the mental model, we sort of... Uh, 
worked out at the time and is, is not surprising, but we made some plot. We found a couple tasks that were sort of fairly plotted on a two-dimensional axis and roughly convinced ourselves that the policy kind of worked if the rollout, if the evaluation happened that was kind of in the convex hall of the training data, right? It's not doing something magical. It's not learning to tie shoelaces if you just flipped up shoes or anything like that, or even if there's something just very different than what you saw at training time. But it's doing a surprisingly good job of interpolating between less data than I expected, right? So this kind of convex hull of the training data I, is still a reasonable model, I think, of, of how that how these systems are working. Of course, GPT sort of taught us that maybe if you're aggressive enough, the whole world can be in, in your training data. Of course. Why would this point present here? If you had some cloth on the table, yep. uh, are we looking at the latent features yep. here? Yep. So this was actually plotted in a dense descriptor space. And we had, we had a, a particular example of where we had a, just two dense descriptors. We, we, we compress it down to a two-dimensional space. So there was a lot of gymnastics to get this into a plot that where the convex hollow was meaningful to visualize. Um, but we did experiments around it to try to sort of uh, you know, feel that that was a valid analysis. It took it, it, it did take some work to sort of make the 2D plot. Thank you for asking. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think most people would say supervised learning is incredibly good at interpolation and is not doing much extrapolation. But if you read everything on the internet, then interpolating is like useful. Right? Pretty much anything you can ask is somehow in the convex all of the things you've seen. So that's the big question. Maybe one of the big questions is uh is how far do we get with behavior cloning? Is it to the point that every manipulation task is interpolation, okay? Or do we make a breakthrough that makes it extrapolate? Okay, so so that experience taught me. I had to underestimated how valuable a high rate RGB feedback could be in a control system. You know, the depth is pretty good, but RGB is so much better, actually. Okay. Um, so, <clears throat> and the other thing to call out, right? So there's this, I mean, again, it might be naivety in some sense, but just matching the demonstrations it took it removed the notion of cost function right, tuning or hacking, right? In particular, if you like, how would you write a cost function for the onion, right? I mean, it's if you don't have a good state representation, it's very hard to write a cost function that can be evaluated from your real sensor data in order to do sort of RL on that directly. And also, although I'm emphasizing RGB, uh, I think behavior cloning has kind of unlocked, and we could do this with other. Uh, machine learning te techniques, but behavior cloning seems to be like sort of the fastest way for the field to start dabbling with using a microphones on the fingertips, for instance. There's been a couple papers this year about that. You know, we've seen, we've, we've done a lot of work with visual and visual tactile sensors. You know, if you have a different sensor modality and you want to know how much it can contribute to your manipulation pipeline, it's much easier than it used to be to sort of throw that in, get the data and start asking questions about just, it's not quite information content, but it's, it's, uh, it's valuable. Okay, so number one for me is just control from pixels, which is already a lot. Okay, um, and the second one, this is only two, you know, but the second one was when GPT was discovered, if you will, right? Uh, I mean that that changed my 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 world, right? I mean that I I don't know how quickly all of you embraced it, but once I started seeing that, I realized something totally different had happened in these high dimensional spaces. And um, I think as an optimization person, uh, I want to understand that these very high capacity models with their super high dimensional landscapes change the optimization problem in a way that I think I, we must try to understand, right? And its connections and implications for control could be very profound, right? So uh, I think there is a natural progression. We've seen LLMs be very successful, you know, Maybe roughly last year or even two years ago, we started seeing the visually conditioned language models, and now we're starting to see actions, right? So large language models going to, some people call them vision language models. I think I find it a little bit more accurate to call them visually conditioned language models because often those models are image and text in, text out, right? Of course, we're seeing more and more multimodal models more generally. And then at TRI, we call them large behavior models. Right, so to just try to emphasize that we're not bolting actions on at the end. I, for, to me, VLA is a, a little bit like, okay, you've trained a vision language um, model and you're gonna see if we can add, do a little fine tuning with actions and we want the action data to be uh, 
primal, okay? But they're all pretty much synonyms. By the way, we're hiring. I, should, I just didn't want to forget to say that at some point. <clears throat> and that's, a, you know, we have an LBM division now. That's cool, right? With the machine learning folks and the robotics folks are all now pushing towards this vision together. So the question that that brings up, I think most of us are convinced about LLMs. The VLMs are pretty darn impressive. And not, you know, you can, I, we could argue that, okay. The question is, is predicting actions fundamentally different? Uh, should we expect to see similar generalizations, scaling laws? Or do we have any hope of generating the amount of data that we would need for those models? Okay. And I've heard lots of reasons why actions are potentially very different. Right? They're continuous, whereas language tokens are discrete. You have to obey physics, which, of course, um, some of the things like a language model does deal with somehow feedback and stability a little bit, but not in this. They don't have to deal with perturbations from the world, for instance, right? Or stochasticity. Um, but I would say, although those are all very reasonable arguments, I just think we've seen enough from behavior cloning now that that risk has mostly been tamp down. I think the this, this single task results that we were highlighting and, you know, to see them first person and see, you know, trust that they're really robust for me, that those, those suggest they could have been hard, but we kind of, we seem to have been past that. Okay. Um, I do think there's a big fundamental change. Most of what we're talking about today is single task uh, behavior cloning in my mind. So you have one task, you're going to give so, some number of demonstrations, but the field, the, the LLM to VLA or LBM, that's really more about multitask. So like at TRI, we've spent a lot of time last year thinking about single task, and most of our time this year thinking about the multitask, more like the foundation models. So that's like big questions come up. What does common sense look like for control? I mean, we know there's all this great combinatorial generalization happening in language models, right? You can ask GPT to, to write me a sonnet in the style of Shakespeare about, I don't know, uh, you know, Mahi's, Mahi's VC tutorial or something like that. And it would, it would do that, but it's never read Shakespeare writing about Mahi's tutorial, right? So it's clearly interpolating extremely well. And what does that look like for control? I think we need to discover. I think it's going to change a lot of things. So as someone who loves controls, I feel... I must, I must understand that, right? Um, and maybe, maybe just maybe, uh, allowing these big models to see physical interaction data and have the ability to run experiments, have interaction with physics, will help them have more common sense about the real world. Maybe even more optimistic. What if our control theory, you know, like I, we understand MPC pretty well, you know, people are dabbling with MPC and large language models, you know, all the MPC folks are like, they don't know what they're doing, you know, but, but may, maybe there's some lessons, like once we connect the dots, that we can actually, it might even be easier to understand what's happening in the high capacity models, once we can embed it in physics. And wouldn't that be amazing, right, if we could somehow push that forward? Is that okay? Yeah, oh, Nemo. idea that maybe I want to pick up all stones and just for a few demonstrations, I'm definitely not going to be able to pick up all the other stones. So I'm I'm wondering how do you see that? Is that a multi does that fall in the purview of multitask or is that like what is what is a single task and what is a multitask? Awesome. Good question. So I'll repeat it just because the microphone got to you in the middle there. Um yeah, so so how do you define a task? How broad is a task? This is like the thing that people debate over, you know, beers and nobody ever finds an answer, right? Is what's a, what's a skill? What's a task? Uh, the definition maybe here is it's the convex hull of your training data. Okay, so if you want to pick up all the spoons, you might have to give a lot of training data to to sort of cover that region of interest. You could call that one skill, train a single skill policy on that. In my my view, but maybe I would recommend instead of spending all that time you start working on the multitask things and train something a little bit more narrow, you know, that where hundreds of skills give you pretty good coverage. 
uh, sorry, hundreds of demonstrations give you pretty good coverage. And, uh, and then you start training many of them together and see if you get the compositional generalization. That would be my hope. Great question. Yeah. Hi. Um, so I was wondering where does uh, classical control fit in this picture? Like, do you see it as some low level skill that where you still use MPC and things like that? Or um, also, yeah, I was wondering uh, because now it's mainly on these, uh, these large models, but still, classical control should be about very yep. valuable. Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, for the sake of sort of clarity of thought, the simple version of my answer is there's not classical control in the final in, in the in the in the final model that you're going you know from observations down to roughly actions in practice what we're doing right now we have a low level controller that's doing the things and you should i think you should probably always do this for the things that you do have good models of like robot self collisions you know we have a low level controller that's preventing the robot from self colliding and why why wouldn't you do that but if it's like you know the state of the onion you have to lean on the learning to do that, even though that's close to brass tacks in terms of control. That's something that I would put, you know, at at relatively high rate. It's kind of it's a very controls and physics thing, but because I don't have a model based solution to that, I don't expect to build a skill around that. And, and I'm I'm looking more at end to end right now. Other people will have different answers. I think, yeah, and that's why people say, you know, they they accuse me of of uh, of giving up on the field or something. But on the other side of it is I think we should, I'm still doing control and optimization. I, I think there's more maturity and insights to be found there and lots of good work to do. And I think uh, they are all telling truths about the same you know, fundamental ideas. And I can see more clearly, think more clearly when I'm talking about equations that I can work with and understand their properties. And even if I don't run that code on the robot because of this, I still think it, gives me clarity of thought and is pushing, you know, in the right direction. So don't give up on optimization and control. Okay. Yeah, please. Yeah. What do you believe will first kind of achieve really impressive uh, kind of uh, demonstrations, like in these kind of multitask on horizon tasks, uh, either first control or these kind of Approaches. Okay, good. You, so you asked the right question. Let me repeat it. So like, what, what do I think is going to show some really impressive things first? Um, if my, if I was making a startup and I had to like have a product next year, my answer to you might've been different, right? So, so I'm a scientist and I'm trying to, you know, push the frontiers of my knowledge. And for that reason, I'm saying, let's study the end to end object and let's study the, you know, uh, I think system engineering building that's trying to get well above 90%. Is in a different place right now, and that that gives different answers. I wouldn't rule out what you can do in terms of long term reasoning with these models, though. It's I I, I had discarded that early. Like, well, certainly it's not going to do like a really multi step complex thing. Uh, some they can do pretty well yeah, if you have the favor of these reason benchmarks all elements still. <laughs> there are combinatorial like if you said there's a bunch of Scrabble pieces in front of the robot, you know, spell. Uh, something, it's not going to do that very well. But in terms of like making a salad, I'll show a video of making a salad later, right? Um, it's a multi-step. You might break that down into skills. We didn't. We just trained sort of big things. We did the skill version too to try it, the chaining version. But, um, you know, I think it's surprisingly good to do sort of, if you can give the demonstrations for it, you'd be surprised how far it goes. Did you have a question? Yeah. Here, is that is generating any data available to present? Uh, um, so do you think they based on methods to generate any data or do you think that? Okay. Yeah. Uh, to generate any policies, is that one thing that you think is very Absolutely. So data generation, you know, with privileged information in in simulation, you know, we have great tools to do that. Um, my, yeah, my bias there would still be towards the models because we have great, you know, as opposed to I'm, I'm a little biased against RL for those problems, even though I think we need to learn the lessons that RL, RL has uncovered. Uh, so it'll play an important role in, in that for sure. Ultimately, I think we need to get self-play and improvement on the real robot too. 
So we'll see. I, I'm still optimistic that the, the model-based things will have a role in that too, but there's some answers that I don't have yet for that. Okay, so that was all the yeses, all the why. Like, this is why BC is great. Why not BC? Like, why? what should you be? I mean, maybe some of them came up a little bit. Not everybody believes, right? Um, it requires lots of data, right? Uh, but, I, you know, honestly, one of the things that amazed me was that, I mean, 100 demonstrations sounds, maybe, does, does that sound like a lot? I don't, I, but it's like, think about the size of the pixel space and the size of the action space and like, how big that is and the fact that you can do you know 50 to 100 demonstrations and get pretty imp incredible rollouts that's already like surprisingly data efficient i think you, it depends how you count and probably we're in an overfitting regime for those i don't mean to to say otherwise but um it, it, out of the box it wasn't quite as hard as as we thought but i also think as we migrate from single task to multitask that data question changes dramatically you know i think if you want to add a new skill if it's your first skill, then 100 demonstrations are necessary. But if you've trained, already trained with 1,000 skills and you're adding the 1,001 skill, uh, maybe you only need a two demos, 10 demos. I don't know what the number is going to be. We're trying to figure that out. What are those scaling laws? So don't rule out things just because of the 100 demos of today. And even I think we've seen enough startups launched that believe that even with that kind of numbers, they can make useful things. Yeah, of course, yeah. Awesome. So I will speak to the tricks of of balancing. Yes, I'm sorry. The the question is, uh, how how do you get those hundred demos? That's part of the part of the curriculum today. Is to talk, talk about some of those tricks. How do you like, um, how do you get good demonstrations that that give you the robustness that you want to see? So if I don't say that by the end, then a little bit in the second part, we'll talk more. Okay, and the other one um, in my mind is, I think there is broad agreement in the coral, let's see, uh, ICML, NeurIPS, iClear kind of world that I don't think we need to get the same amount of robot data that we needed to get for language, right? Because we think we can transfer. So, um, you know, the way I say that is there's kind of a, a robot data diet and at one extreme, the best possible data we can get is robot teleop data, right? It's exactly using the actions on our robot. Uh, it's, the, it's the perfect data for, for me and my robot, right? But it's small. And then there's like the internet scale data that's YouTube. There's no action labels on YouTube. Language feels even farther away. But wouldn't it be amazing if we could somehow transfer? That seems like... Of course, there's people working on this, right? Of trying to write action labels and infer actions from video, from YouTube videos and things like that. Okay, but the point that I like to remind myself is that um, that's big data, big transfer, small data, but no transfer. Okay, but we don't have to like jump from YouTube and Common Core all the way to robots because we have cross embodiment data. It's not quite as good because it's some other people's robots of you know unknown quality, for instance, but it's still action labeled, right? We have Sim, which is not quite the same as the real robot, but it's pretty good. Um, and then we have, you know, novel devices like the Yumi you saw this week from Sharon and what Laurel and, and company have done for, for a number of years. We have lots of ways to sort of make clever input devices, which are, uh, you know, scalable, but still closer to the data we need. So that's the bet is that a little bit of this data combined with internet scale data and other intermediates can actually lift us up without having to get massive, massive data. Okay, so I'm trying to sort of say like, I, we don't need a lot of data. Uh, requires a lot of compute, right? Uh, Mahi pointed out that, you know, compared to RL, maybe it's not a lot of compute, right? Because in the sense, I don't have to do lots and lots of random trials, but I still have to train big models potentially on big GPUs. And honestly, I, I just agree. That's, uh, that's, gross. I, I don't like that at all. It makes me sick. Um, and it's annoying to like wait for things to train. But come on, something happened and we have to study it and then make that better. I, I, I don't really, I admit that's a, that's bad. Are, is the inference, oh, please go ahead. Yeah. I can just repeat the quick. Yeah. I just told the I can repeat so he doesn't have to run over with your microphone. 
Yeah, I agree that it's going from a very high level phase of the network to an action phase, which makes sense. But uh, if you look at it from that perspective, the amount of data, 100 demos is not that much. But when you said 100 demos per year, does it also mean like that they change for the same scale function, they need to open a list, you change the list, uh, or you change the object, then you then you require again new de demos for that. So, it's, so it depends what scale it is. I completely agree. So the question is, um, you know, when I say 100, yeah, it's it's hopelessly underdefined what I said. Uh, it's just giving you a ballpark. But yes, I think if you want the skill to be robust to more diversity, you tend to have to give more demonstrations to cover the, you know, to, to make sure that the stuff you care about is in the convex hall. I completely agree with that. That is, there's nothing magical protecting you from that. Um, unless you could transfer from the internet or something, right? Okay, a lot of people worry about slow inference for control rates. Like, how could you run this thing at a kilohertz? Yeah, I, I don't think you should run it at a kilohertz. The, like, intelligence happens at different rates. I don't think most of the stuff that we're associating with language and and you know thought should needs to happen at a kilohertz. So, I, I guess I'd say we're getting you know depending on which models in the one to ten hertz, you know, you can't win a ping pong championship that way, but you can you know make a pizza that way. If I, I think so, it's you know there's a dynamical time constant of the task, and I think most of the tasks where the this stuff will pay off first. What's that? Pizza. Oh, sorry. Okay, maybe pizza. Yeah, the Domino's pizza guy wants to do it fast. Yeah, he's he'll be version two. Yeah, he'll be a version two. Yeah, but that's a good point. Yeah. yeah. A lot of the tasks that they have been successful on are kind of inherently stable in the sense that all gravity points down in the case. But, um, so how do you feel like using these kind of techniques made of the locomotion where the well the world tries to pull away from the Yep, yeah, that's a good question. Good question. So I, I think they're um I'm sure people are doing it on locomotion. I haven't seen uh something that comes to mind immediately for I mean yeah, mostly I think RL is working better in locomotion right now, and BC is working better in manipulation right now. Is it just a super too simple you know, oversimplification? Um, you could try to make these models run at a rate that would be good enough for stabilization. It's not crazy. The question is at what level do you need the capabilities that they bring? Is it the footstep planning level, or is it really like the torque, uh, you know, ankle torque level? And uh, you know, we historically in locomotion also had layered controllers. And I would be aiming this capability a little bit at the layered controller level, not the low level torque level, but to be determined. I think I think we can get these numbers higher, but you're probably not going to be evaluating your like video diffusion model at a kilohertz, right? That just doesn't doesn't seem like a goal you should like stake your thesis on. <clears throat> uh, okay, and then not yet robust. A lot of people are very worried about the fact that it doesn't, you know, like, how can I make a product out of this? And I agree, like I said, if I was making a product, I might have a different answer. Um, but my thinking about that is that we should try this because if we come out the other side, you know, in the best case, we will have developed a totally new type of robustness, you know, not like, you know, restoration to a trajectory or things that we kind of know how to do very well, but really like, physical common sense, you know, when things go very wrong, very out of distribution for a single task, you know, I was giving demonstrations just for one task, one task, one task, and I never thought that, I don't know, the microphone could just fall down, you know, that was just maybe I never thought to give a demonstration like that. But if I've done enough tasks and I've watched enough YouTube, then no matter what happens, I might have some capability ready. So that's the hope for me, is that we have something like the common sense reasoning we've seen in language available for control. And then once we have that, then you can uh, start digging in and try to get your 99.99% make a product, I think. Other people are trying to just like, you know, what if I did 20,000 demonstrations? And I, I, I don't know, but that's not something we've done. Cool, this is great. So, all right, so a couple of the core ideas and challenges that uh, that I think one must discuss here for uh, for behavior cloning. One is the notion of dealing with distribution shift. A lot of people associate this with Bagger. There was a series of papers by Drew Bagnell and company that sort of articulated this very well. And that back in the day, it was a super tux cart, uh, a racing game where he says, I'm gonna train with imitation learning, driving this cart, this driving game, okay? But then as soon as you like run the policy, 
then the problem is that you start driving and you're all, you know, you're making almost the right predictions, but there's a little bit of error. And then you're a little bit off the nominal trajectory. And now you're a little bit out of distribution. And then your model's more wrong and you just, just fall out of the sky in that particular example, right? And so this compounding error that can happen, not only because it's a feedback loop, but because the, the, a little bit of error can take you where your model is no longer trained and then things get bad fast, right? Uh, so that's a real problem. And we should ask, how is this being addressed or is it being addressed? And then the other one, which is actually interesting because I think people have different amounts of uh, conviction about whether this is a fundamental problem. Uh, I feel that it is, you know, from, so the example we did for this little T pushing and the diffusion policy paper that um, Chung had this beautiful sort of example where if the goal is to push this T on the, on the table to this green position and your finger is currently over here, then there's kind of a symmetry. You could go left or right looks a little bit like a brain, you know, but somehow there's a, there's multiple ways to accomplish the task and the, the task and the current state does not tell you which way to go. Right. And so humans will have given you some data in both directions. And if your model is not capable of dealing with that, then you'll, the model will go right up the middle. So at some point we need a model that has the capacity to, to write distributions over actions. Yes. So could you say already that this is a multi-task problem? Um, because it's like already two skills, right? One skill could be going from the right side and that one from left. Yeah, so uh, it, that's not wrong, but I, I, that's, I, we prefer to think of that in the single task framework, being able to deal with the, that multimodality. But maybe it should split it to different skills. So. Yeah, you could try to split, split that into different skills, but I think fundamentally you're gonna get data for this objective and this state that goes two different directions and you need to be able to handle that. Sorry, I didn't repeat that carefully, but maybe that's okay. Okay, and there's interesting questions for people who like to think about feedback control and the like, because actually out of the box, stability and dealing with multimodality seem like they should be at odds. How can you be stable, but also be able to split and go left or right around the tree? Um, I, I won't go into the detail of that yet, but there's interesting, I'd love to talk about it if anybody cares. Okay, the questions are awesome. Please keep them coming. I will. Um, do my best to keep on time here. So let me give you kind of a very simple, overly simple, maybe taxonomy. Yes? Question for Zoom. How useful is simulation data for learning behavioral quantum policy? Okay. I will, uh, I don't mean to be rude to the Zoom person, but there's a bunch of slides coming for that. Awesome. So that'll come very soon. Okay. Let me give you a quick taxonomy. And maybe this is helpful, even if you know, uh, you know, it took me some time to sort of compile and decide there was a way to break this down. Okay. So Roughly, we have a policy that's taking histories of observations, putting in trajectory. That's a sequence learning problem, right? Any dynamical system is somehow a, a sequence learning problem. And most of the models we're talking about today, this is, you know, in control stock, I've got other ways to say it if this isn't your favorite way. But most of the models today, including the GPTs of the world, are operating in sort of an autoregressive, you know, next token prediction, right? So you take your history of observations or history of tokens, and you're predicting the next token, and then you shift by one, you run it again. Right. That's as opposed. That's a, as opposed to, for instance, state-based models like LSTM. We've seen LSTM for behavior cloning too. That that can work, but I think the ones in favor right now are more in the autoregressive class. Um, I think these days, and you you pretty much all, often have a transformer in the middle. For some of the single task things, you don't need that. But um, but I think nobody would object if you put a transformer in the middle. They seem to be pretty amazing. Uh, <clears throat> so maybe the question then becomes. How do the different architectures distinguish themselves based on their input encoders or their output decoders? And maybe since I'm a controls guy, I'll start with output. Okay, so here's the kind of the classes that you people have for output decoders. The robotics transformer, the RT1, RT2, RT1X, RT2X kind of models, they use discrete tokens. So it's, it's like really, you have a language model already, right? And it's writing out my gripper is going to, it's not quite writing the number 0 0.2, it's, but it's writing a, a token. And depending on the language model, some of the language models actually have tokens reserved for the, the numbers between, let's say, one and a thousand. Some of them don't, so you have to just hijack the lower, the most infrequently used tokens. But you just assign some of your tokens with to, to these uh, values. Okay, and actually, you know, it's sort of surprising how simple it is in those in these models. They, they discretize each direction, uh, just with uniform bids, they take, you know, in the data, lowest value, highest value, uniform discretization, 
done. We'll take the block it into 256 bin bins, and uh, that's my output space. Okay. Uh, there's an open source reproduction that we were involved in not too long ago here with OpenVLA. So you can kind of dig into the code. And the Google folks were kindly involved with that. So they kind of kept us in check, making sure we were representing. Okay. And then, uh, you know, Mahi and all have been working on a series of models that are called behavior transformers, uh, BET, and then more, most recently VQBET, which start with the discretized token idea. Okay. But instead of the uniform bins, they're doing smart bins, if you will. So our, first it was k-means, and then the VQ is using a, a vector quantization approach to find a nice space in order to do the discretization. And then in, in addition, they're learning an offset head that sort of adds in a, a more continuous value, right? So that would be a way to go a bit more, you know, still use the token idea, which is strong and nicely compatible with the big models, but but make them a little bit more continuous and a lot smarter in the in the discretization, okay? Action chunking transformers were the ones that came out with Aloha, right? The, um, the Aloha series. Okay, these are natively continuous outputs. It's still a transformer in the middle, but, but the output is, um, is it's trained as a variational autoencoder that's conditioned on the observations. Okay, so I didn't, I'm not gonna, you know, you, may, you might know a lot about that. You might not know a lot about that, but roughly it is an attempt to try to learn a distribution over possible actions. I should say that the nice thing about the discrete action spaces is that we know how to learn distributions over discrete outputs, right? You just have uh, you know, a probability of each possible discrete output, a categorical distribution. So those, those have been doing you know, uh, multimodal, handling multimodal demonstrations in language and in actions right out of the box. That's the major advantage. And this is a way to do sort of more multimodal distributional reasoning in the continuous space. Um, and in the paper, original paper, overall, we found the CVA objective to be essential in learning precise tasks from human demonstrations. Uh, but then I've also heard on the word on the street is that a lot of times they turn off the CVAE and maybe, I don't know, maybe at Google, they don't use CVAE. Ah, so then it's just an MLE cost. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure. You should ask your friends at Google. Uh, but so there you go. Uh, and then... And we have diffusion policy is maybe the fourth output option where the outputs are fundamentally maybe continuous. You're trying to learn the log probability of the distribution. Okay. And then you have to do more work at sampling time in order to, to denoise your actions and get the, get the actions out. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Yeah. So. Yes. How would you like conceptually make this different? Like, is this like a state space controller kind of, or? I think that this is just all, all of them could be from observations. They could be from state. This is just how do you decode the output of your neural network into into a actions into your joint commands or. Yeah, so as far as I know, this action chunking, they have the full kind of sequence. I'll, I'll get to that in just a second. Yeah, I promise. Yeah. Okay, so all of those deal with cat with multimodal demonstrations. If you used a discrete output space, you have categorical distributions. That's what, for instance, AlphaGo, GPT are doing, and the robot transformers are doing that. Uh, and then that action chunking transformers diffusion are doing that even you know more in the continuous high dimensional uh, continuous trajectories. Okay, so what? How do you like go? I'm going to speed up just a little bit. I'm taking too much time, but um, so I think honestly, with enough capacity, they can all fit the demonstrations, right? So. Uh, I don't mean to say one is just better than the other. I think I don't know how important continuous versus discrete is. I know I have a bias because I've been doing controls, you know, and it seems to me like if you have, if you've discretized your action space and, you know, you, you've lost the ability to think like this motion is more like this motion than this motion. Did I say that well enough? Like it's somehow the, the distance in the continuous space is lost if you've done discretization. So it's like really hard to know. Have you lost some inductive bias of closeness? You just have to memorize everything independently. But I don't worry about like the floating point precision of the discretization. I think that's probably fine for a lot of the tasks. I just wonder if it matters for generalization interpolation. Uh, DP is probably the most expressive in terms of that output, but it's also the most expensive at, at inference time. I've heard things people say recently like, ACT kind of wins for the, the, the dexterous stuff, ACT kind of wins in the small data regime, maybe DP wins in the bigger data regime. And, um, and some people don't really even think we need that expressiveness, right? So turn off the CVAE, 
see how it goes. There's a bunch of other things that make me, I think people have converged on these just having stable tra training, known hyperparameters and stuff like that. Yeah, I do think another lesson that we've learned is that both in ACT and diffusion policy and BET, actually the newer versions of BET, are predicting sequences of actions instead of just one action. And in, you know, in regression, we might call that forecasting. In controls, we might call that model predictive control. You plan your series and you take the first one and then you plan your series, you take the first one. Okay, that seems like both Chung and Tony were the ones doing it at the same time, ACT and diffusion policy. They both sort of came away saying like, that was really important to make it work. We've still been thinking about why. I can talk more about why if that's useful later. Okay, I won't have as much to say about input encoders because that's not my thing as much, but um, you know, people use pretty, there's a fairly small set of, of different encoders you might want to use. You know, EfficientNet was back in RT1, ResNets of different sizes, VIT. I think a lot of people have shifted to VIT when the when the data gets large enough. Um, pretty standard ways to drop your encoders in there. Of course, there's slightly different answers for for uh, tactile and for uh, <clears throat> audio, but there's a kind of a recipe that you can grab from the machine learning world uh, on that side. Uh, these days, when we talk about multitask, we typically adapt an ML, a VLM for from the input encoder. Uh, and the transformer backbone. Do you believe that there is no any added value to really add explicit objects? I so I, again I don't um, so do I believe there's value in adding explicit objects? Right. So this was very much the end to end. I don't say adding more structure is bad. You should, people should do that research. I'm dialing in a more end to end approach. I want to understand that as an object. It feels like something I could think relatively cleanly about. So that is my preference right now. No skills at the bottom or whatever. Yeah. That's true. I see. So, so the question is, yeah, for, for inputs, do we use joint torques? Um, do we whatever? I, so um, how would we encode that? Yeah, people are asking, I think some people would make a low-level control. In fact, we make a low-level controller that's using impedance control or joint stiffness control at the low level. Um, I think you could work on those. I don't have off the cuff an answer for the right way to encode torques. I think that should be thought slightly carefully, but I, I think absolutely um, those could, could be put into. I think we do probably new, need new architectures, but let me just sort of put my grumpy old man hat on for a second and say, uh, we definitely need more but I actually think we just want to understand what we have first. I, I really don't understand all the basics of this, right? So there's clear limitations in the current approaches, right? Um, sometimes some of the big models have an observation history of one. And you ask the authors, why do you have an observation history of one? It's like, well, we tried to, and it worked worse because uh, of overfitting and other things, right? And so that's like not satisfying, right? We should fix that. Or why don't you use proprioception in your model? It, we tried and it didn't work. Right, so there's just very basic things that we need to to figure out. Uh, I hope this isn't, you know, I feel like when you ask questions of the people who are really in the weeds, and Laurel did that a little bit, and we'll show you some uh, afterwards. It's interesting that you get pretty different answers for the basic questions, right? Which is great. I mean, it means we're in a field that's exploding and we're trying to figure it out. But I, I really want to like just lock in the, the essentials. Um, but most often the answer is like, why didn't, why did you choose this? You know, the answer is often like, we didn't really try that yet. Um, because the reason I think we still don't understand the basics is that we've been relying as a field on small numbers of hardware evaluation rollouts, right? So a lot of the statistics in the papers are like, we ran this on a robot 10 times, you know, it worked two times and someone else has worked three times. So that, you know, the, and it, it's because, uh, for a lot of things, right? First of all, uh, we don't believe that just open loop predictions, which would be what people do for LLMs with some success, are predictive of closed loop performance. So we believe if you want to convince me, you actually have to do hardware rollouts or you have to do rollouts in some sense to, to make an argument. Uh, many people don't believe in SIM. I'm sure none of them are in this room. Uh, uh, and doing hardware experiments is just time consuming and biased, like super biased, okay? Uh, so at the right as it stands, the statistical power of these is just very weak. And I would say this is a call out to the field. I think we really need to do better here. We need to get more rigorous. So here's my quick pitch for that. Chung um, in the and, and company in, in the 
UMI paper made these plots which showed the distribution of initial conditions for each task, right? It was a, you know, an, a small exercise in like numpy edition of images or whatever, but um, I think that's just so useful. Like we should all do that, I think, right? Or, or something like that, but somehow show people what the distribution of uh, you, were, you were covering with that is. That's one rec small recommendation. Yeah. Um, at TRI, we get, try to get much more rigorous about our hardware, hardware testing. We have non-experts run like hardware CI. Uh, important, like we all know this, but we many people don't do this. It takes time and whatever. So the, the trials are randomized. So the person running the test doesn't know which policy they're evaluating on each trial. And the very next trial, it's a different policy, right? That's just like the only way to get rid of the bias. And they're blind, yeah, so they don't know which policy is running. Like this stuff matters. It just makes the statistics better. And then we make tools for trying to, if, when we want to have like more rigorous um, uh, initial conditions so we can have more consistent results despite the complexity, we make these sort of software tools to just help people align the goal image with the, the current state and they set it up quickly. And that just allows us to reduce some of the variability in testing. We're trying to do proper statistics, right? So um, given, pro you know, basically nobody puts error bars on their our, our BC tools, right? We should, it's not that hard. Uh, we've got a particular version that we've been working hard on uh, with Max Schwager and company, Joe, Joe Vincent. Uh, so you can ask like, what are the confidence about, given I've run this many trials, which either succeeded or failed, and I wanna have some confidence in my upper and lower bound on the six probability of success, how do you how do you do that? There's a particular uh, slightly more efficient way to compute that that is in this paper, and you can do things now like okay, I want to run experiments until either policy A or policy B is with some confidence better. Like the lower bound of policy A is above the upper bound of policy B. You want a separation, and these are just good tools to have, right? But it requires getting more rigorous and scaling. Um, success is like very object subjective. If you ask like the robot to make a salad. And then you ask like 10 people the rate, whether that's a success or not, but you're not going to get a uniform answer, right? This is, these are, as the tasks get more rich, the notion of just success or failure starts to feel uh, insufficient. We've been working a lot at TRI on a simulation-based eval. Uh, and we, uh, we, we try, to, try to keep a close match between sort of have a digital twin and hardware and reality. Uh, just to say quickly, like the philosophy in Drake is, to, I mean, there's, there's simulators out there, Isaac, Physics, Hujoko. There's relatively fewer that are sort of trying to be very accurate and, and pushing on those contact solvers. You know, Justin uh, and I were bemoaning that there's really not that many people actually still working on some of the fundamentals of contact simulation. He is, I, we are. Um, and, and Drake has chosen to be closer to real-time rates. It's different choices than Mujoko, but it's really does a lot of work to close the sim to real gap. And so I think if that's your take, it's not probably the best choice for RL, but it might be a good choice for eval, uh, eval. And I think benchmarking and data generation are two different uses. Um, so then we have this sort of simulation-based eval, which is really meant to be very multitask. So scenes that you can do lots of different tasks. It's not very, it's not immediately visually obvious what you should do. If you look at the task, you need natural language instructions. And we're gonna try to release this soon uh, with, with data to go along with it. I'll skip over some of the things and I won't run the little robot even though we, we worked on it for a while just before. Okay, so you know, this is just sort of like some of the single skills that I trained this last week. Uh, um, uh, and Siwon trained a bunch at, at home uh, uh, in order to just show you kind of what the simulation rolls out, rollouts look like. You saw both our simple visualizer that is good for roboticists to look like and these are the simulated cameras that the policy looks like. And you can see things that this is like a little bit more contact rich, just you have to stack some plates and drag them a lot. There's a lot of sliding contact and things like this. So we're now when we're rolling out policies, we're hammering away on simulations of this complexity. Yeah. Um, that is, uh, there's a couple reasons for that. Uh, when, and we'll talk about it more in the DP thing, but I do think when inference is slower, the, then you start getting these jerks. And if you don't do the sort of velocity matching correct, uh, we get some of these jerks. I say in simulation, they should be gone. We're close to getting them gone. In hardware, I, we do still have a little bit of jerks, but other people have really gotten those out. Good question. Yeah, so we're going to try to release this. And I know I've heard many times that Drake is hard to use. I'm sorry. Uh, this is like a one line, you know, give me your policy, okay? 
run a lot of trials and give me back the statistical bounds. So you can't say it's too hard to use. If you do, I'm just like not going to believe. Um, okay. A and it'll give you bounds. You know, it'll give you like these. This is just taking different checkpoints of my training run uh, from, you know, from zero, which of course is not succeeding. Uh, it and up, and then you can get upper bounds and lower bounds using that sort of tool. And if you run enough experiments, you can try to get separation. Okay, so BC is working surprisingly well. It's enabling robots to do tasks that were impossible just a few years ago at some limited success rate. We talked about a few of the key lessons in architectures and uh, that I really still want us to dig into the basics. So the plan from here is, uh, that was kind of a, the overview. I'm sorry that it took a little longer than I planned, but um, thank you for the questions. Uh, so, so we're going to turn it over to Mahi, uh, and he's going to start digging through uh, sort of the details of each algorithm. Yeah, I can take a, I can take a couple questions. Is that right, Mahi? Yeah, you're okay. Please. Do you think the methods have like upper bound of accuracy and performance on different tasks? But do you think the upper bound of the performance of those methods is hundred percent, or do you think it's lower than that? So I think the upper bound is a hundred percent. So yeah, there's a question which is like. Um, if I just gave like a 10,000, I don't know what the number is. I've heard 5,000 in some places, right? You know, giving 5,000 demonstrations for a particular task, like do I get to 100%? I, that's that's a good question. I haven't done that question because I want this common sense for buses, right? So um, again, if everything you're gonna see in the robot is in distribution, is in the convex hull, then you, you should expect 100%. I do think that, but I think it's hard to achieve. Right? I think we're in a very open world, messy setting where that's what we're aiming for. And so you know, it's be very hard, I think, to prove that. I don't, I don't look for absolute certification. You have the yeah. So do most of these uh models and stuff what you see is the first of I don't see Giving you the impression that we're safely out of singularity <laughs> with our current setup. I'm going to repeat the yeah, um, the so, so the question is roughly like, what about singularity? What about larger workspace? Um, and so, I, if I've given the impression that that's true, uh, I didn't mean to. We get <coughs> singularities often. We deal with them appropriately with our low-level controller. You know, but actually, if you want to hammer on your low-level controller, making sure you've understood every possible singularity and every possible action space. Putting these policies uh, to work on them is a pretty good way to find all your bugs. So, so that does require a lot of work to, to handle. Make sure you're low. In our case, the low control is doing. Does it affect the transfer policies? Yeah, I, mean, I think both in Talia and in rollout, even on a single skill, all on one station, we already deal with this. And then certainly, if you've got a different, even a different station, similar robots, we deal with that. And if you have a cross embodiment, then but the arm could be different to quickly drag you into something that this robot's not capable of. Good question. Okay, yeah. Uh, can, you, can you hear me? Yeah. Sorry, I, this is a really basic question, and I'm sorry if you already answered it, but like, is it better to um, do like, collect data for like one skill a thousand times, or is it better to like um, collect a thousand different skills, say, fewer times? I'm not sure. I mean, this that's a great question. No, no, that, that's that's right. So I don't know. Uh, yeah. So I think we understand relatively well, although I have complaints about our the depth of our understanding, the sort of you know 100 ish uh, demonstrations for one test, and you could you could do that a thousand times. I think the new science that I'm most interested in is the lots and lots of skills. You know, all, all of kosher. Okay. So that I would say we have glimmers of that in the published literature, and we'll see more of that. But if you want something to work today, I say maybe do the single skills. If you want to be cutting edge on this stuff, I'd say lean into the multi But you know, if you're doing a startup, we give you a different answer. Okay, so. Yeah. Do you think that we are still missing from the from an algorithmic point of view? And I think that we can policies, because that's something maybe from a 
All right. Thank you so much, Russ, for such a great intro. And I must say to the people out here that, you know, it was scheduled to run for a little bit shorter. So if we accidentally cut into the coffee break time, I apologize for that in advance. This session is going to be more talking about the nitty gritty details of it. We're going to be talking a little bit more about, you know, like what environments are, what they look like, how do you diagnose it, so on and so forth. I also thank all of my collaborators for making this a possibility. Um, there are a little bit more of the basic content here. It's a little bit more low level. And, you know, like I'll try to go a little bit faster because of the break. But if you have more questions, please ask those questions so that I can try to answer those. All right. So in this session, we're going to be talking more about hands-on supervised policy learning. There's two parts of this. The part one is right now. The part two is after break. But both of the sessions, we're going to be talking a little bit more about the low-level details rather than the high-level introduction stuff that Ross talked about already. Um, so first thing we're going to be talking about is we're going to be talking about some basic terminology, right? Like you'll hear this a lot, you know, like Asian policy, environment, data sets, what are those things? I'm going to go a little high level, but I'm going to be just trying to touch on those in case people are reading the slides later and want to know more about it. So, you know, what is what? What is an agent? What is an environment? What is a data set? All of those things are terms we're going to be running into quite a lot. In my head, I think of the, you know, all of this are relevant. They will come up when you're trying to do this by yourself. The first part, let's say agent policy, all of those kind of are related to the robot. You know, you're running a robot in some environment. This is about supervised real robot learning. Um, we use the Hello Robot Stretch a lot. Russ and Tiara uses the Franca. There are a bunch of other robots that you'll see out there, but that's on a high level what we're, what we're going to be talking about when we say something is an agent that's running in the real world. Environment. So people use those robots in different setups as well. Um, for example, we often tend to take our robots into a random home. Here's a one robot in a home trying to put a rag into a, a washing machine. On the top, that's kind of like more of a kitchen table environment. Um, that we often see on videos from TRI. But, you know, wherever you're running a robot is practically our environment. And the final part is really data set. Data set is a little hard and more abstract to talk about. But the high level is that, you know, all the robot behavior that you've done and you've collected in many different ways, all the observations that, you know, your robot has seen and will be acting on, that's the observation part of the data set. And there's an action component to it. Right, which is more or less what your robot needs to do in an given an observation. And we'll talk a little bit more detailed about it, but you can think about it as just pairs of observations and actions indexed by time. Um, and you know, like people get these data sets in many different ways. So for example, how do you collect data? Um, there are different things. For example, there are like teleoperation tools like Aloha, where there are like follower arms and leader arms. Uh, there are teleoperations like Russ just showed in a video where people use like mouse or space mouse to collect robot data. And for example, there are more innovative tools that people use. For example, the UMI tool that was presented at RSS, or for example, the crash picking stick with the iPhone that we use often. So all of those things together will basically build up what your, um, what your basic trio here is for supervised robot learning that I talk about often. Um, so if we're clear about that, I'm going to move on and I'm going to talk a little bit more about how do we set up an environment? What is an environment, right? So here we're talking about, you know, like we have an agent, which is run by a policy, and then you have an environment. An environment and agent is really just interacting with each other. That's the high level idea 
for you know how they're put together. So the high level idea is that you know like the agent is observing what's going on in the environment. That's kind of the first step in anything. Um, once you have an observation, the agent tries to act on the environment. And because of that action, right, the environment changes somewhat, ideally, if it has any effect at all. And once the environment changes, the agent observes again, and then it acts again, and so on and so forth. It kind of goes in a cycle until, ideally, your agent has solved the task. Um, so in this part, we're really going to be talking about more of a simplified environment that we made up for this tutorial, right? This is a little, um, you know, a little ball in the maze environment. It has like kind of bouncy physics. It's on an HTML page, so you can also like go and play it on your computer. Um, not going to be showing a demo for this right now, but it is interesting because it has kind of this bouncy physics. And if as a human, you're trying to control um, how this thing moves, um, often it is hard to control for a human because you almost always kind of like overshoot. Right? There are some narrow pathways you try to go, and then you overshoot and you bounce in like a random place. So you can try it out later, but I think that's the environment that we collected a lot of data on. That is the environment that we're going to be training and showing a lot of examples from. So what is you know, the agent in the environment here? You can think of the agent here as the little blue ball that is moving around, jumping around, and the environment as the rest of the maze. The red dots that you see are kind of goals, but we don't explicitly talk about goals here. Just think of this as the points the ball might be trying to go to, right? And we again give this to people, people play this game and then they collect some data. That's the data set that we're gonna be working on today as on the environments and policies we're gonna be talking about on this part of the tutorial. Um, so here, what is the observation space? What is the action space? These terms might be familiar to you already, but the whole idea is that, you know, um, you have the observation and action going back and forth. So we define it in a very simple way. Again, this is not going to be visual motor. So this is just going to be observation space of four dimensions, two dimensions of position, two dimensions of velocity. And then the action space for the ball is just going to be the two dimensions of force. Um, again, this is very simple. We just want to understand like the very basics of what's going on when you're trying to do behavioral coding. So given this, right, uh, the next part is kind of setting up our code base of everything that we're going to be doing today. The code is open source, so you should be able to just download the data set, train your policies. We'll all have all the configs as well out there, so you can just train it, run it on your own computer. Um, we're not going to be doing it hands-on during the tutorial, but later on, if you want to go back and play with it, that's an option. Again, the setup is very simple. It's a few lines, so you know you should just be able to download, run it on your computer. Um, and I'm going to be also showing like snippets of the code that I run to generate the policy that I'm showing you here. So it will be coming back a few times. Um, so once you have this, right, once you have an environment, let's understand what those data sets look like. And the tool that we're going to be using to understand what an op like data set look like for demonstrations, we're going to be using open loop replay. So let's talk about what open loop replay is. So once again, you have an environment, you have an agent, and you have this data set. You have this demonstration data set, it is observation action pairs, indexed by time. That's the way you should think about it. Um, and what if you know your agent is not super complicated, the agent's not super smart, all it does, right, it takes the sequence of actions from the demonstration and it just plays it out blindly in the environment, right? So it is not taking the observations into account at all. What it's trying to do is, you know, takes a sequence of actions, it just replaces it back in the environment. Okay, so the question could become, is it okay? This is a particularly stupid thing to do. So why would we want to do this, right? And the reason behind this is, as I said, it is very, very helpful for understanding the data set that you've collected potentially. So for example, here is us doing in the LBM eval environment that Russ just talked about. We're open loop replaying a demonstration collected on the same initial conditions. And when I say initial conditions, as you can see, there's some bell peppers, there's some apples and a bowl, so on and so forth. Imagine that things haven't moved around at all. So it's the same initial condition. We're replaying a demonstration we've collected. Here's what that looks like. The robot picks up the bell pepper as expected, and then the other arm is gonna go in, drop the bell pepper on the bowl. This is exactly what the demonstrator collect, demonstration collector did as well. So, you know, given the same initial conditions, your robot is doing exactly the same thing as it happened. And again, we're doing this in a simulation environment because it's much easier to set it up to the same initial conditions. But what happens when your initial conditions are slightly different, right? 
Here's another example. This time, the initial conditions are slightly different, and we're replaying the same actions from the same demonstration that I showed in the previous slide. Here it's playing out. The robot is going to try to grasp the bell pepper, and it missed the bell pepper. So of course, now it's just moving in on empty air. Right. So as I said, this is not a very smart way of solving a problem, but this has particular advantages for which I really like this to investigate and dissect a demonstration data set. Right. And not just demonstration data set, but also often your robot setup. Why is that? Um, these open loop replays are a very valuable debugging tool, right? They're not, they're not trying to solve the problem, the task that you have, but it is more trying to solve a meta problem. And the meta problem could be something like, oh, your robot setup might not be right. Maybe your action space is not right. Maybe your actions are not recorded properly. And when you're trying to do behavioral cloning in a real robot setup, especially when you're trying to get started with a new setup, this is a big problem, right? Oftentimes you're gonna be trying to do something on a real robot, okay, you have a setup, now I've collected some data, now you want to run a policy on it, but even before you run a policy on it, even before you try to understand, okay, why is this working or not working? I think just running this, very helpful in practice. Yes. That's a good question. How do you usually run this open loop policy? And I would say that I just have an ad hoc script that given a starting position, it just replays the same actions. We just replay the actions on the robot from the demonstration. Yes, so this is this is just taking one trajectory from the demonstration and it's replaying it. Yes. You mm -hmm. have A and the goal B, right? Mm -hmm. And in between there's no feedback. We just execute it. Right. Here, I don't I don't know where is the B. Where is the loop? I, I mean, why don't we just call it your play? It's happening in my mind. Because right now you're just you're dumping the actions, right? But you collect I'm just executing them, right? So I don't get it why it's open loop. Isn't it just replay? That's a, that's a good question, because I think when I think about this from, you know, like a behavioral cloning perspective, I think of closed loops as when you're taking feedback in from the environment. Right. So you take in, you know, for example, your observations, that is your close, closing the loop. And when you're not closing the loop, that's how I define as open loop. So the terminology might be slightly different from the exact yeah, control. Clear, but we don't have here a target, right? Just you're replaying what you have, right? So. The target you can think of as a, like the task completion on a high level. I don't know if it's satisfying from the control perspective, but I don't have quite as much of a control background. So I'm sorry about that. Right. And we can talk more offline if you're not happy with this. But okay, so going back to this, you know, replay, as one one uh, audience member suggested, one of the big value is understanding that you don't really have scaling issues. So what are the scaling issues? For example, a lot of time you collect a record like robot data at some frequency, and then you play it back, but then you have to understand like, okay, are we playing it back in the same frequency? Like collected at thirty hertz, maybe it's playing back at ten hertz, five hertz, so on and so forth, and that can make a lot of things fail. And a lot of time your actions might be scaled improperly based on how you recorded the data. So this is a good way to understand this. Another part is just understanding the time step discrepancies and the latencies in the system, right? So a lot of times, you know, you collect some data, but before the data gets collected in different components of your system, introduces a different amount of latencies. And to understand how these latencies are impacting your system, when you like run something open loop, if you see there are like delays in part and part, certain part of it, that could give you a signal of like what's going on. But anyway, I, all I want to say is that there might be different problems in the parts of your system that you would not want to deal with as you're going through the whole loop of training a policy. Because training a policy itself takes a lot of time, takes a lot of compute, and you don't want to waste on that unless you've ensured that your data collection is going properly and the actions that you've collected are actually meaningful and not complete noise or garbage. However, some problems are actually not that, you know, it doesn't require as much of a closed loop feedback. For example, right, if you're running a ramen factory, then maybe all you're doing is just kind of running all of your machine in an open loop, right? So here's, for example, ramen is being packaged and there is not much environment feedback that is going back into the systems because, you know, they're just producing maybe like 10,000 ramen packets every minute. And that's exactly just how they're working. There is no closing the loop, there's no data going back into the policy essay. And so that's kind of the part that you want to understand, right? Is if your system is 
kind of deterministic, you kind of know, okay, this is exactly all my starting states are going to look like, then maybe you don't really have to worry about learning a policy. Maybe you can just run your robot in a completely open loop and solve the problem, right? Like if I want to pick up something from here and put it to the left, maybe I don't have to worry about the fact that, you know, like what I'm picking up is appearing at different places and my target is moving around. It could be exactly static. However, as you see in this environment, right, I'm running like the same rollout, same actions, 50 times from different starting points in the environment. And as you can see on like the different ghost bouncing balls, um, that different balls are ending up at different locations just based on the fact that they started at a different position. So if your starting points are different, maybe your open loop trajectories will not be working very well. And it's not just about starting points, it could be different objects in your scene. Again, we're talking a lot about manipulation today. So different objects in your scene could be different. There could be some stochasticity in the environment dynamics, right? And there could be a little bit of stochasticity in your robot controller as well. So all of those things could actually make your open loop replay not work at all to like less than what you want it to work on. And so that's where the policy comes in to fill out a little bit of a gap. Do people have questions so far? Yes, please. Okay, so um, I would like to make sure that I like, basically record everything that I need later on. Are there any, maybe you come to this point later, are there any hacks for that? That's a very good question of like, how do we collect data that is somewhat, it's called what Shuran calls robot complete, right? Enough data to train a policy. And the answer to that is that there's no clear, clean answer to that except to run the robot policy and understanding that you have sufficient data. And again, a lot of times you're collecting data, but a lot of data you're also throwing away, right? For example, you have some sort of touch information. Maybe you don't have the sensor, but the robot still has a tactile feeling and you're not recording the data. There is an audio cue all around. When you like bump into a table, it makes a sound. You're not recording that data. So a lot of times we don't worry too much about collecting all the data rather than collecting sufficient data to run our policies and to validate that unfortunately you have to run the policy. Um, this is, yes. One other thing, it, sorry. Uh, one trick, I guess, is that if you force somebody to tally up through the sensors that you're recording and they're able to accomplish the task, then that's a kind of a fairly good way to say that it's information complete, right? You know, if you give people only the ability to look through the cameras that the robot has the only, and see the robot sensors and they can still do the task. Right. Thanks, Russ. All right. So this is kind of a, idea of just going through open loop replay to understand you know, how your environment is behaving to the actions that you've recorded. And if it's failing miserably, then maybe you have to go back and look into the actions you've recorded, try to understand if you're replaying them right, if you're even like recording and replaying them in the same, you know, same action space. Things like that often come up. So now that we have actually recorded a good robot demonstration data set, Right, because we've like collected some data, we replayed it, the replay works fine. Let's try to train our first policy. Right. So this is going to be very simple. This is going to be as beginning. And this is kind of like also historical a little bit, because that's what you know, like I started off doing when I started doing behavioral cloning in my first year of PhD. Right. So we're going to be talking about behavioral cloning with a multi-layer perceptor and, and mean squared error loss. So again, the learning, you know, like the deep neural policy learning idea is something like this. You have a map that maps observation to actions within neural network, right? It's again, like not very complicated. This is, if you know neural networks, if you know, okay, I have this problem, that's probably what you wanna try. So what do we do for the architecture details, right? Like that is something important that we have to understand. Um, how do we set up the architectures, right? This is the base skeleton. I have observations that I wanna map to predicted actions with a model in the middle. And again, I want to have a loss function that we update this model with, right? If we're going to be doing some sort of gradient backpropagation to update our network. Okay, so now the questions become, what is our model and what is our loss, right? Because once you have those two things, once you have a data set, supervised learning, you can just update your model, you can train a model, and then the rest of the part ideally becomes pretty akin to other kind of supervised learning you've done before. For this part, what are we going to be talking about? Our model is just going to be a multi-layer perceptron, right? It's just a stack of fully connected layers. And then for our loss, 
we're going to be using a mean squared loss error, right? So again, you have a multi-layer perceptor and fully connected neural network. You pass in your observations into it. Again, in this case, the very specific toy example is four-dimensional, right? It goes through the network, gets transformed somehow. You spit out two-dimensional actions. And then these predicted actions and the ground truth action, which you have from your data set, you just compare them. You take the squared error. You average them out over a batch. You take gradient back propagate through it, right? Very high level, very simple idea. You should be able to implement it out if you have implemented other neural networks before. You can also take a look at the GitHub repo. We have the code there already. So you can just play with it. Yes. The question is, why am I given position and velocity? And why am I using you know, the force or acceleration as, a, as an uh, action? And the answer is not quite. It's just a very simple and very often, for example, old school you know, open AI gym environments would do it like this. Um, so that's, that's what I'm using. There's, there's no sense of like, oh, this is complete or enough data. Um, but it does matter that you're given the velocity because if you just use the observations, like that is not enough information. You want to react differently. Uh, so that's that. Yeah. But if you want to make it, you know, like complete human in the loop, it's probably very hard, as Russ said, for a human to just look at those four numbers and decide what actions to take. So it would, in reality, it'd more be a visual policy. So, all right. So once you have this, right, that is, that is, quite enough for your basic behavioral cloning policy. One catch though, because we want to talk about real robots and real robots have image observations. So even image observations, right? Like for example, here's this camera looking into the scene and you want to like learn how to manipulate this bell pepper. Your image observations like pretty high dimensional, right? It's like 150,000 plus. And if you try to stick that into a multi-layer perceptron, what's gonna happen is your neural network size is gonna just blow up really quickly because it's, it's very, very high dimensional. So what we do instead, right, for this kind of basic kind of new behavioral cloning is we take some sort of convolutional network, right? We pass it through a convolutional network and whatever we get out of the final layer, right? Generally, it's a classification layer. If you take a pre-trained, let's say, ImageNet model, the last layer is going to be 10 or 1,000 dimensional, depending on the task. But what we generally do is we just take out the last layer, which is a classification layer, um, and we just take the one layer before the final layer for the output representation. And that's what we stick into our MLP. And generally, that is pretty OK for a lot of tasks that you may want to do. Um, some people use pre-trained visual encoders, right, just to have a little bit of boost compared to like a completely randomly initialized pre-trained network. Um, so there's been a bunch of classes of this. So I think people started off, I started off using like an ImageNet pre-trained ResNet model. Um, and again, this has been around for a while. Some people use kind of larger web database, semi-supervised train models. So Clip, Dino, Dino V2. Um, and again, these come in like ResNet and VIT variants. Based on your task, you may want to look at different scales of models. And then there are also a recent class of models that are a bit more relevant. It is trained on embodied or robotic data, right? So for example, R3M is trained on Ego 4D or Epic Kitchen data, which is kind of head camera data of a person doing something in a kitchen or a home. Um, MVP is trained on a lot of robotic data. Um, we had our own model, Dobby, which we trained on a lot of data that we've collected in different homes. So all of these things can help you accelerate your learning a little bit. There is a little bit of question about, OK, is it actually helping you get a better performance? Or if it's actually just accelerating your learning? The answer, you know, the jury is still out for this. But the only thing that I think people generally agree on is that it is important for your for you to fine tune your encoder as well, right? So don't just freeze your encoder, fine tune it as well as the time goes on, um, because that I personally believe lets you pay better attention to whatever is relevant to your particular task. Um, a lot of this image and pre-trained encoder is just generally trained to classify cats and dogs. That's probably not what's relevant to your robot. It is a good initialization nevertheless, but fine tune it. Okay, so once we've talked about this visual encoders, let's just say, okay, what does our policy trained on our four-dimensional and two-dimensional data look in action. So here you can see, you know, like a few different rollouts. As you can see, all of them kind of start out in the same way, goes in a particular direction, bumps into different places based on where it started. And then in many cases, it finishes the task, which is kind of nice, which is what we wanted to see. But another thing to notice is that like, the behaviors kind of look very similar. 
right? So here is another kind of mode of data that we see. For example, here's again, like making a very similar path, maybe bumping to different places, maybe completing, not completing, based on whichever path it went. And also here's a code that you can just run from our GitHub to reproduce this environment yourself. So this is an interesting topic that I want to talk about a little bit, and we'll talk about more after the break about, you know, like this very kind of specific modes of behaviors that you see from MLP. This is very clear if, for example, if you take the action chunking transformer model, um, and here the policy is actually running. The ball is very slowly moving. You'll see in a second. But you'll see this very strange behavior if you just run the act model out of the box on this environment. You'll see that they're all kind of like going upwards to the left in a very specific way, and then it goes to the corner and gets stuck. And I've like tested out with different hyperparameters. This is not a function of, let's say, policy hyperparameters. This is a function of the data set that we're using to train this. So you can train it on different data set. You can get a different output. So the question is, what is happening? We'll talk about more after the break. But the reason why this is important is that there is what we call a multimodality. And there is a mode collapse that is going on in how we're training this. It's a very simple example is if you're trying to do some sort of like least square regression, right? So here on the left, we have a data set where there is observation on the x-axis and y-axis is actions. Again, it's one dimensional on each side. Um, and then if you're trying to fit a least square model, right? In the, and the line goes through right in, right in the middle of it. What is going on is really just a mode collapse. It is just predicting the mode, like a single mode for the bimodal data set. And that is probably not what you want to see. And so that we'll talk more about after the break. Does anyone have a question about this so far? All right, I'll move on. But this is one important topic that you have to understand is that just because you have a single mode or just because you have a model that is capable of learning a single mode does not mean that you know, all hope is gone, nothing's going to work. And we find in practice that a lot of times, based on your data set, Unimodal is fine. Like this is this is paper from Google and it's BCZ and this was trained completely with MSC loss and it worked to be okay. You can see the behaviors here. So it's not like it's always gonna fail. However, there is a little bit of a problem in just using a unimodal model to fit multimodal data. Um, and again, we'll talk more about section two, but there are different ways. Yes. What do you mean by The question is, what do I mean by unimodal model? I mean that the kind of loss function that you're using when you predict with that, the underlying idea is that your output should be from a unimodal Gaussian. Okay. So we'll talk more about this in section two, but different ways of address this. One is using mixture model, which I think I'm like more familiar with from works from 2019 to 2021. Then there are ways of predicting categorical distribution over discrete tokens. Russ touched on it a little bit. There's also ways of using denoising diffusion models. And we're going to be talking about two of this after the break. I'm going to be talking about the discrete tokenization. And Russ is going to be talking more about the denoising diffusion models. And this is kind of the last part of the section, right? This is about building a little bit of intuition with something that is a little simpler than learning a model, right? So this is, we're talking about nearest neighbors. So nearest neighbor is like a pretty early on machine learning algorithm. People use this for early on prediction, regression, a lot of different things. Um, but the idea is very simple. Is that you know before we were doing like an MLP, we were predicting you know our outputs and using an MLP using mean squared error. But what if kind of we drop the model in the middle, right? Like what if we didn't use a model? We take our observation, right? We take our data set that we have for the demonstration, and what we do instead is we find the nearest neighbor for the observation, right? You have a bunch of different rows in the database. You just find out where the observation was the closest to the observation you have right now, and whatever the closest row was. You just run the action from there, right? And you keep doing it over and over in a loop. Very simple algorithm. So why am I talking about this? I'm talking about this because it is actually a pretty good baseline for a lot of things you may want to try, right? So here you can see again, like I can run this um, on the hugging face code that I've written and you can see like different kinds of behavior. Some of the behaviors like more reasonable, some of them are you know a little bit esoteric. And of course, it fails in different environments. And you can see a very easy example of things going out of distribution. For example, it starts out very confidently, but then it ends up in a space where it's, you know, like maybe there's not enough data for this, right? And when there's not enough data in a space, you kind of start getting nearest neighbors from different parts of the space. 
And again, that is not very good for you to execute on the action, like on the policy, on the environment. Yes. So you look here for the nearest neighbor per state or per trajectory? Per state. Uh, you can do it at different levels. You can do it at part n state, things like that. You can modify the variables a little bit. And on the code base, you can actually play with that, right? Like how many observations in a row you're looking up, how many actions in a row you're executing at a time, so on and so forth. But this example is given by one observation, one action. And again, yes. Yeah, sorry, I will talk about it in one second. Um, how do we how do we solve this when we have a higher dimensional observation space? I will talk about it in one second. Thank you for the question. No problem. Um, but yeah, so I think another dimension that you can play around with it, if you have this kind of nearest neighbor based policy, is you can play around with the feature space. Right. Again, here, when we're talking about a very low dimensional observation, feature space is kind of nice and easy to talk about. So, for example, I can modify around how much weight I give on you know, each, of the, each of the different axes. So if I give high weight on the velocity axis of this versus if I get high weight on the observation axis of this, this policy defense behaves very differently. Right. And you can kind of see the intuition behind it. Right. If we, if you were to control this ball, it probably matters more where you are in the overall grid than what your velocity is. And so you can play around with this and you can see different behaviors, but it's just a nice tool to dissect it. And why am I talking so much about nearest neighbors when, as someone pointed out, it is very hard to do when you have a larger observation space is because there are ways to do this with images as well, right? And this is a very interesting way to point out how important it is to have good features for a vision encoder. So, okay, imagine you have just observations you want to learn you know, some sort of nearest neighbor policy, what you have to do is you have to actually learn an encoder for this so that you can do nearest neighbor in the representation space rather than in the image space. Because image space, pixel space, nearest neighbors don't really mean much because the metric of distance is not quite accurate there. So what you do instead is if it's this encoder that you want to learn, um, you pass it through and you get you know, use some sort of self-supervision loss. We've used, for example, uh, bootstrap your own latent before. It's a vision-based self-supervision loss. Uh, we have used MoCo before, but anything modern self-supervision algorithm should work. Once you have this, right, you can just do uh, nearest neighbor over the representation space, right? So before we had like image and action paired, you can think of that now as a representation and action paired. And on the representation space, now you can search for the nearest neighbor, whatever the action is, you can execute it. If you're doing kind of like averaging, you can sample a few different actions based on how far they are. And average it as well. Yes. How do you practically do this? Like, it's not possible that you search in all trajectories. You know, Why not? So you do it. Yeah. So I I can give an example. This is an example uh, experiment that we ran at NYU. This is a paper from twenty twenty one, and this is what we're doing. This is well also presented at RSS two years ago. Uh, but the high level idea is that here we're searching for nearest neighbors in the demonstration data set on the little corner you know, on the low uh, rectangle, you can see the nearest neighbors that we're pulling up from our data set and what the action is on the nearest neighbor. The little arrow, red arrow is trying to show that. And as you can see, the nearest neighbors are pretty reasonable given your observation. And you can just look at the nearest neighbor action to understand what's going on. And this was actually pretty nice for us because it also let us diagnose the problems in our data set. For example, for some of the actions, we were using cold map to retrieve the actions from the images. And some of the actions were really, really noisy. And that really let us diagnose why our policies were not training well. So this is one way of doing imitation with visual nearest neighbor. But even if you're not doing nearest neighbors, just having a good preterm representation can help a lot. So this is, for example, a recent project that we did. This was really trying to get put a robot into a different home and then train it a policy super, super fast. Right. So the idea was we would collect like 24 demos with this crash picking stick with an iPhone and we'd collect five minutes of data, we'd fine tune it for 15 minutes, and then we'd deploy it in the home, right? And to do something like this, we'd really have to learn a new policy in very few iterations. And our hypothesis was that the policies are maybe spending a lot of time, especially when you're learning from a small amount of data, they might be spending a lot of time trying to learn a good visual representation. And then for a simple task like this, like opening a drawer, maybe they're not spending too much time in learning the actions themselves, Maybe they're just spending majority of the time learning the visual representation. So what we did instead was we pre-trained our visual encoder, right? We collected 13 hours of data set from different homes. We pre-trained our visual encoder. And then when we have a new home, new, new task data set, that's like five minutes of data. 
we just fine tune everything end to end instead of training everything from scratch. And that really lets us cut down. Um, so that really lets us cut down on the number of epochs for which we have to train our policy. So before we were training it for 500 epochs or something like that, then we could train it for you know somewhere between like 50 to 100 epochs and things would run just fine. Yes. As a I can talk about it offline. Thank you so much. Um, but yeah, so this is kind of the high level idea that the representation learning can actually accelerate what you're learning. Open question is whether it actually makes the performance better or if you have enough data, can you just end up with a good visual representation just from your data? Yes, question? Sorry. Uh, for that question, what is the action space? Um, for this task, the action space was six dimensional pose and position and a one dimension gripper valley. Um, Yes, so again, good visual representation can accelerate your learning, and that is probably something you might want to look into if you want to accelerate your policy training time. But anyway, this section we kind of talked about many different ways to fail, and after we come back from break, we'll talk about you know, how to address those things a little bit. But you know, a few different ways of policies to fail. One is if you have bad featureization, and again, this becomes a bigger problem if you have visual representations. I'm going in a little bit of reverse order of what I talked about. You could have multimodal demonstration, and here is the act policy kind of not dealing with that very well. And then the problem, it could be that the training set and the test set might be different, right? So here's, again, the visualization for with different starting states and open loop succeeding for a few, but not succeeding for many others. We'll talk a little bit more about all of this, uh, and I'm sorry for taking a little bit longer, but overall, um, this is the end of the session, and we'll come back after the break. Uh, yes. Let's say 410, the initial plan was four, but let's say 410. Thank you so much. All right, everybody, welcome back. After the break, um, we're gonna start our next session now uh, as people trickle in. Um, and hopefully we'll get to talk a little bit more about the details of behavioral learning from supervised demonstrations. All right, well, thank you for coming back. Those of you who, those of you who came back from the break um, and people who are joining us right now, we're talking about supervised policy learning for real robots. The whole idea is that, you know, behavioral cloning and how we are getting behavioral cloning to work on real robots on different setups, different environments. This section, we're gonna be talking more about the details that matter more. Uh, this is divided up into two parts. The first part, I'm gonna be talking for a little bit and then Russ is gonna be talking about a little bit about the particular details of the algorithms and what matters when you're trying to get those to work in a different a different environments. And then the final piece of it would be Laurel um, coming in. We're gonna be talking a little bit about a survey that we did. Um, Laurel, can you confirm we're recording this on Zoom? Okay, great. Um, so Laurel's gonna come in and talk a little bit more about a survey that we did of practitioners doing behavioral cloning in different setup um, and from their opinion, what matters. So without further ado, I'm just gonna start talking about the first part of the second half, which is behavioral learning through tokenization. And I'm gonna be talking about this class of algorithms that we call behavior transformers. Um, the whole idea here is of course, you want to learn this diverse behavior and how do you learn that by just tokenizing your behavior? So. Let's talk about it. Before the break, we talked about different difficulties of adapting you know, MLP-based behavioral cloning to the real world. There are big challenges, for example, featureization, right? Perception is hard, and visual motor policies are definitely harder than doing state-based policies. Um, there is, of course, a problem of test train discrepancies, right? There is you know, like some sort of cumulative error that comes up that causes models to derail. The initial states are sometimes very different so on and so forth. And then the third and final difficulty that we touched upon a little bit is the idea of multimodality, right? When you have demonstrated behavior that has different modes. So some people were confused on Zoom before, they were asking, okay, what is the, what is the definition of multimodality? So on this part, I'm gonna be talking a little bit more in detail of what multimodality means here. And you know this is gonna be the focus for both my and Russ's part on this half. Um, so I think this is kind of important for us to clarify early on. So 
here is a very simple problem that we may want to solve in the real world, right? Here's this, let's a door to my bedroom and I want to open this. And, you know, I want to collect some data, of course, because we're doing supervised learning. I want to collect some data of opening this door. Now, the interesting thing is that the door is like slightly cracked open, right? So I go and like, you know, I collect some data on opening this door. I go and like grab the handle and I pull it and the door opens. Okay, great. That's like one way of opening the door. I've opened the door. Let's say I collect like 100 data, 100 data points. Okay, that's fine. Now, you know, like imagine I go back and then I, you know, like my mom comes to visit and I'm like, oh, hey, mom, you know, like, why don't you collect some data for me? Because, you know, like the last, we just ask friends and family to collect data for us sometimes. So that's what she does. So she goes, she starts collecting data, but instead of going and right for the handle and pulling it open, she goes somewhat differently. She goes around, reaches for, you know, like the door opening, pulls it there and then just pulls it open. Both of those are actually very valid ways of opening doors. There's like no a priori reason for why we should prefer one way of opening the door to another way of opening the door. They're both valid. They're both equally correct. They're just different ways of opening this door. And this, what we broadly define as modes of demonstrations or modes of data, right? Like going straight for the handle, pulling it open, or going around, reaching for the crack, and then you know pushing it open a little bit. And this is very two clean, discrete modes. There may not be such clean, discrete modes for this. So, for example, you know, like if I have a tree or you know, like this bottle right here, and I want to go around it, I can go around to the right, to the left. Um, if you're going through navigating a city, there might be many different ways of getting to your target. Um, so what I want to say is that this multimodality is everywhere. It is maybe not as clean. Maybe this is not as discrete, but this is a clean, discrete example of what we mean when we say multiple modes in data. And this becomes more relevant the larger your data set is, right? Because if you're collecting data and if you're trying to collect a large data set, you're probably not having one person doing everything in the exactly same way. You're probably going to want to diversify a little bit. You want to probably get many people in for collecting your data. And of course, as many people there are, there are going to be as many style or more of collecting this data. There are going to be more and more modes of how the data is being collected. This is why I personally believe that it is very important for us to kind of consider this problem of multimodality as one of the primary challenges of behavioral learning, especially behavioral learning at scale. Here's another example of what we just said of large action data set. Right. So this is kind of like a little setup in our NYU lab. We had this kind of little kids play kitchen setup. We had a Franca arm and we had, you know, someone come and collect some data for us. Right. And their instruction was something like this. You open the microwave, you open door and turn the knob. So here's the environment, right? So it's like opening the microwave oven and it's like turning the knob and it's opening the oven door. Okay, great. They got everything that we told them done. However, right, this person, the student came in another day. And this is what he did for the same instruction, right? He's opening the oven and then, you know, he's turning the knob and he's opening the microwave door, right? He's doing exactly what the instruction is. He's doing it right, right? Both of all the tasks that he said he's doing, he's doing it right. But again, it's the order is different, right? So even if you specify the goal, right? Whether it's a language goal, whether it's an image goal, whatever it is, there could be different ways to get to the same end result. And that is what we're talking about when we talk about multimodality, especially multimodality in larger data sets. And in this half of the talks, we're going to be talking a lot about how do we deal with this multimodality. And again, last section, we gave a slide of like different ways of handling multimodality. We talked about Gaussian mixture models. We talked about you know tokenization. We talked about using diffusion. But one of the ways I think about it is really saying that like, okay, what are the large models that we've trained so far as, you know, like larger machine learning community? Let's take inspiration from that, right? And when I think about it in an abstract way, like I think this class of models, this kind of tokenization-based models are more inspired by the language class of large models or the more denoising diffusion models might be more inspired by, let's say, image or video generation kind of models. But anyway, that's for another days of larger discussion. So let's start talking about how language models deal with the multimodality problem, right? So again, you understand that language models are, you know, large models trained on an entire internet corpus of data. And of course, you know, if we define multimodality coming up when multiple people give you data, then of course these data sets will have multimodality. There's quite no doubt about it. So let's see how these models are actually modeling the data that they have, right? 
So it's going to go something like this, you know, like you feed it and token, right? Here I'm like illustrating this using words, but they use a slightly different concept of tokens. But you can think of that as, you know, like commonly reoccurring parts of words, but not worry about it too much. So you feed in a word, let's say I, it gives you something, right? Like it says, I saw. Okay, great. You take the saw and you put it back in into the model. All right. So it says, I saw a cat on a something, right? So at this point, right, it's kind of what we call an auto-regressive modeling. We take, we feed in token, we get whatever output, we feed it back in. So that's the auto-regressive part. That there is like no multimodality so far, but where the multimodality comes in is that when they predict the next token, they don't just predict a single token as we're seeing here. What they predict instead is a distribution over tokens, right? So they're taking all the possible tokens that they have, you know, like OpenAI GPTs probably have something like 50K to 100K tokens. We don't quite know yet because it's not open source, but that's the hypothesis kind of range. It has like all the possible tokens in a huge list. Um, and then you just pr predict a discrete categorical probability distribution over your tokens, right? So it could be that like, okay, I saw a cat in a mat. That is a 76% probability. I saw a cat in a bed. 12 person probability. I saw a cat in a tree, two person probability, so on and so forth. And there's going to be just, you know, like a list of like 50,000 of these. Yes, question. So this is probably quite a basic question, but um, <clears throat> these tokens, they're, they're manually defined. They're not just automatically learned. They're manually defined on this token. So um, these tokens are learned with some statistical properties. So there is something called byte pair encoding that is very commonly used for learning tokens. Um, you can look it up. This is not quite part of the tutorial because it's slightly different than our domain. All right, <clears throat> so here's an algorithm, right? That is just predicting multimodal distribution over tokens. And we'd be very happy if we could just use it out of the box, because again, this architecture has been proven to work for one domain, right? And a lot of times it's kind of, you know, like machine learning, we'd like to learn from each other on what works, what doesn't work. But there's one big problem. Um, this problem is the fact that we are trying to predict actions, right? We are not trying to predict words, we're not trying to predict tokens, we are trying to predict actions in the environment. And the problem with actions is that the action distributions are continuous distributions. They're not discrete distributions. And so learning a multimodal distribution over actions, especially continuous actions, is very difficult. So the question is, how do we actually learn, let's say, the alphabet or the tokenization for our actions? And that's what we're going to be talking about for the next few slides. So there are different ways of doing this. Of course, different papers do it differently. One of the simplest way of doing it, um, you know, like, okay, this tokenizing action problem is, you know, you think about this as like a black box, right? Like this is not quite to think about it at a like low level, but at a high level, you just think about this as, you know, I have continuous actions, I have a tokenizer, and then tokenizer gives me discrete tokens. And discrete tokens, you can feed it back into the deed tokenizer which gives you back continuous actions. This is important because when we want to sample from our distribution, when we sample from our policy, we want to be able to sample continuous actions and not discrete tokens. So the idea is that you have a tokenizer, you have a detokenizer, and in the middle you have the discrete tokens, and you convert this problem from predicting continuous distributions of actions to predicting discrete distributions of tokens. But then, you know, like this is interchangeable in some ways, right? Continuous action to uh, discrete tokens, discrete token to continuous action, if this relationship is kind of bidirectional, this problem is more or less easier. So here's one sample of how this is done, right? So this is done, for example, in OpenVLA, in a lot of the RT algorithms. This is called uniform or quintile binning. Um, to my best of my knowledge, I might be wrong, it was done in trajectory transformer first. Uh, but the idea is that like you take all of your actions in different bins, you put them in, in each axis, you put the actions in different bins. Right, so uniform binning is when you put the actions in bins that have equal width. Um, I believe the RT models put it in bins of width, uh, total 256 bins of equal width. Um, I believe the OpenVLM model does something similar, but I might be wrong. There is another way of doing this, which is quantile binning, which is taking in consideration the data distribution of things and making each of the bins contain equal amount of actions. Either way, basically what you're doing is you're thresholding all the action axes and you are trying to predict which bins they fall into based on the value itself, right? So action dimension zero, action dimension one, 
you know, as the values are different, you're just binning them differently, as you can see in this image. Um, uniform just says equal width. And once you have this, right, that's one of the ways of going about it. In our paper in 2022, we did it slightly differently. We said that like, okay, there's no a priori reason for why every axis should be independent in this way. So what we did instead was we took a very classical k-means based clustering algorithm. We passed our entire action data set through it, and then we clustered into k different bins, right? Again, this is like a very simple classical k-means algorithm, and you can see on the colors where every action ended up. Again, the goal is very simple. The goal is to learn a tokenizer for your continuous actions. Here, the tokens are you know different bins, different colors, and each of the bins has a mean. Yes. Uh, these actions are could be single action. It could be some n actions in sequence. It could be full trajectories, but generally it's one action or just a few actions in a sequence and not the full trajectory. And then more modernly, right? Because we just want to discretize things. We took a little bit more inspirations from other domains like audio prediction and so forth. And we use this more novel algorithm called vector quantization. Right, vector quantized uh, variational autoencoder is what we used for our more recent work. Um, and in this one, we're just encoding and decoding um, the action data set using this variational autoencoder. And in the middle, we're using a code book to enforce the fact that the autoencoder values are sampled from uh, discrete distribution. Yes. So the inheritance is more to make this kind of for actions, I don't believe so. I don't think there is anything out of the shelf. Or for example, you can think of LLMs, there's like something called tick token that people use very often for tokenization. And that is kind of the future that I'd like to see that there is a just uniform, universally accepted action encoder decoder that exists, but we haven't gotten to that point yet. But all of the idea, right? Like getting into the details of it doesn't matter as much as the fact that now that we have this, now that we have a way um, of quantization, this distribution is discrete. And because we have a discrete distribution, this distribution is easy to learn a multimodal distribution over. And that is really the key point we were looking for before because, you know, like LLM like transformer predicts discrete uh, categorical distribution. Now we have converted our action distribution into a categorical distribution so we can predict the probabilities over it. One of the nice things that I want to go back to for one second is that, um, and something Russ touched on as well before, the idea is that, okay, one is that you might lose out on a little bit of the resolution. Um, and one of the nice things about the VQVA encoders is that you can increase the resolution and you can use to kind of predict larger, more you know, distinct categories with a higher um, with a higher level code, but you can also use a residual encoder, which you can see on the plot here, to get a little bit more fidelity or a little bit more resolution. Again, this is an implementation detail. You'll look into it more when we talk about more, like more details of the algorithm. But okay, now that we've converted into um, discrete categorical distributions, we can just use this, right? And we can predict, uh, we can model our behaviors like GPT models words. So step one, of course, as always, is tokenizing your actions, right? You take your continuous actions, you pass them through a tokenizer, and this comes out as discrete tokens. Great, that's step number one. Step number two is, you know, like you want to predict the tokens given the sequence of observations using a sequence model, right? So generally what it looks like is that you have a stack of observations, you know, like some H observations in a row. Um, you feed them in into some sort of sequence model. So generally it's a transformer. I've seen some recent work that works with, um, let's say, SSMs and so on and so forth. I haven't personally tried them, but the idea is that like, okay, you pass them through, you get a categorical distribution and you can sample uh, action tokens from there. Okay, that's great. And if you want to calculate the loss, what you do is you take the ground truth actions, you pass them through the tokenizer and you get like discrete ground truth tokens. And once you get those two things, you can just compare the categorical loss and you can take gradients for that, like gradients through that, through the sequence model that you have in the middle. So far, this is pretty straightforward. You know, we convert our actions into tokens we compute a token loss, and then we improve our network using that. One of the nice things about this is that, uh, sorry, to detokenize or to sample from this distribution that you've learned, right? So now that you've like improved your network with a categorical loss, you can detokenize it. Um, and once you've detokenized it, 
you can get the original actions back, or ideally something close to the original actions back. So once again, to sample from this, you pass in your observation sequence, you get a sample token, you detokenize it, there's their action. One of the nice things about this is, of course, because this is a transformer model, you don't have to be very specific about what you're putting in, right? So you're putting in observation sequence. Okay, great. That's one of the ways to go. But then you can optionally add in like different kind of conditioning. You can add some sort of like image goals. You can add in like language goals, all sorts of things. You just put them in the same transformer. It should more or less generally work in the same way. And again, you're calculating the loss same way. You're, uh, you're sampling the actions the same way. So there's nothing much that is changing on the architecture side. And one of the minor details that matter is, is adding a little bit of offsets to what you're sampling or what you're predicting. So what are the offsets? Let me talk about it one second. So here's, you know, on the top row, a continuous variable. In the middle row, you have discretized it using, let's say, 10 bins. Right. And here you can see on, you know, like X axis and Y axis, how the values have changed. So if you subtract from the continuous ver version to the discretized version, what you see is that there's a little bit of offset there, right? It's not exactly the same. And this little bit of offset can actually be important if you're trying to do some sort of like task that requires high dexterity or that requires a little bit more action fidelity. And this actually, we saw when we were running our own evaluations that there would be many closed misses. So for example, if you're trying to reach for the bottle, there would be a very closed miss that misses it for like a couple of centimeters. So that's why, right, we wanted to do a little bit more. And one of the points that I want to make is that even though you're kind of like increasing the number of bins gives you more and more fidelity, like here, you can get 100 bins and that's even a little bit more fidelity. All it does is squishes down the magnitude of the offset. It doesn't kill it, right? This offset is still there and you could do better, but if you're discretizing it, there is probably going to be a little bit of loss to fidelity. Maybe it matters, maybe it doesn't, depends on your problem, but in our many cases, we've noticed that it matters quite a bit. So what we do instead is, you know, like while we're predicting the tokens, right, the discrete values, we also predict a little bit of the predicted offsets, right? And the offsets are continuous values. We're predicted at the same time. And then we want to take the loss from it. We pass our ground truth actions to the tokenizer, right? We de-tokenize it and we find the difference. That is the offset value, that is the ground truth. And so we regularize the network with that, and that gives you a little bit of better signal for the network for what to learn. The more details are you know, in the paper, and we're not gonna be talking too much about it, but that gives you a very high level idea of what we talk about when we talk about the action offsets. Does anyone have questions so far about the offsets? All right, moving on. So this is kind of the full architecture of VQBet that we're not gonna be talking about too much today. And it looks scary, I know, but all of these pieces we've already talked about in whatever I talked about already, right? So what I'm just gonna do is I'm gonna show you how this works. This part that I'm covered up, this is the sequence modeling part, right? Take observations, goals, pass it through a sequence model. This part is really just nitty gritty of offset prediction because you want to get the offset model quite right. And the top part is really loss calculation, right? You have the code prediction, you have the offset prediction or discrete token prediction and offset prediction. And you want to figure out the loss is actually calculated right. So feel free to go back through the slides and try to understand the details. I'm not gonna talk about it too much, but all I wanna say is that even though the architecture looks kind of complicated, this is not that complicated because we've already talked about all of these pieces. So once we have this, right, what can we do? This is, few samples from the VQ behavior transformer algorithm, right? And the nice thing about it is that all of these different behaviors that you see are actually starting from the same initial position. I'm gonna to try to restart the video. And as you can see, this robot, based on how you are sampling the tokens, is behaving very differently. This was trained on a data set that is, has a lot of different behaviors on the same data set, different tasks completed in different orders. And as you sample through the network, you get different behaviors from the same network rollouts, which is pretty interesting because it starts from the same exact observation end state. And you can see it in different setups as well. So for example, here's like a very simplified end environment. You're looking at it top down. And once again, the data set had the end going at the different goals in different orders. And as you can see, this is again, going to the different goals in different orders. So once you've trained from a data set, as you sample from it, you kind of get back the similar kind of diversity in behavior that you had in the data set, 
which is really nice because go back to, you know, like opening the door example, there are some words, you know, like straight at the handle, some going around it. But the idea is that you want to really learn from all the data that you have given the network. And the idea is that here, you're actually using all the data that you've given the network. So that's a nice and desirable property for our neural network for behavioral cloning. One of the nice things is that this kind of carries over in the real world. So there's like one policy trained on different kinds of door opening. As you can see, like as you roll it out different times, it's opening different doors. Again, this has not been specified which door to open. The network only knows that it just needs to open doors. So you roll it out different times, and based on the randomness from the sampling of tokens, it is opening different doors, which is, I think, pretty cool. Um, so this is kind of the high-level idea of what we're talking about when we're talking about VQ behavior transformer. And there are different things that matters as well when you're trying to model your behaviors using this kind of behavior transformer or VQ behavior transformer class of work. Yes, please. Uh, let's say like your model starts going into one mode. Okay, so the question is, once you have gone into one mode of behavior, do you have to worry about actions coming from the other mode? And the idea is that not quite. Because once you go into one mode, you feed back the observations to the network, right? And because there's kind of this auto-regressive nature into the network, the network should know which mode you're on. So the next behavior should be conditioned on the previous behavior that I've seen so far, and your sampled actions should be coming from the same mode. If you see different kinds of behavior, then there's probably a bug in the implementation, and you should double check it. All right. So once we've understood, okay, on a high level, this is how behavior transformers work. Um, let's talk a few details about what matters in this implementation. One of the things that matters really is the uh, balance between the code book prediction loss and the offset loss, right? So as I said, there's like two different laws that we're training with. One is for predicting the, predicting the tokens and one is for predicting the offset, right? And we use kind of this hyperparameter alpha to balance out those two losses. And again, they fall into different, um, how do I say, they're, they're not even in the same unit because one of them is a categorical loss and one of them is an L1 or L2 loss. And that really depends on what your action space is. So based on that, what we want to do is we kind of like want to balance out the different losses from the different heads. And so there are a few things that we can look at to figure out the balance. The first is the code prediction accuracy, right? So this one we talk about, we talk about as you're predicting the tokens, on your training or evaluation set, how much are these tokens being predicted as a current current token from the ground truth? Again, if, if your data is multimodal, then it's probably never going to reach 100%, but it will, you know, like hopefully go up. And if it's like very close to zero, then it's probably there's something's going wrong about this. Maybe your alpha is too high and you're putting too much weight on the offset loss. The other direction of this is for example, predicting actions, right? So if you're predicting the offset action error, right? If you see this value to be very, very high, then maybe you're putting too low of an alpha and now your network is not optimizing for the offset, lot, uh, offset loss at all. So in practice, we need to kind of balance this out a little bit. We're thinking a little bit more about how to do it automatically, but we don't have quite a good solution yet. So pay attention to this first before you debug other things. That's step number one. Next thing is that, for example, we could predict one action at a time, but if you have like a nice auto encoder architecture of like VKVAE, you can also predict multiple actions at a time. And as Russ said, as you know, my colleagues if, while doing act paper or division policy has noticed, sometimes predicting multiple actions at a time actually makes a large difference. So I would say also play around with this parameter a little bit until you find a nice value that you like um, and that performs well in your environment. And on the bottom, actually, you can see all the names of the parameters in our implementation code so that you can play with it yourself when you go and look at the code. And then the then one of the other things that we look at is the sampling temperature. I don't know how many people have actually played with, let's say, ChatGPT or other sort of LLMs, but one of the things you can do when you like sample from this using a web UI or whatnot, you can set the temperature for sampling. The temperature on a high level is, for me, intuitively, Higher temperature means more entropy, more chaos. Lower temperature means more deterministic. So if you set the temperature to zero, the sampling from your LLM, or in this case, your VQ behavior transformer should be completely deterministic. If you make the temperature a little higher, then it would be more uh, stochastic. And sometimes the stochastic behavior is kind of important. For example, 
in a very simple case, I can give an example. Um, so imagine, you know, like you collect demonstrations for someone going and reaching the bottle. Okay. Um, what happens is that sometimes people go and stop and then move again. And that is a problem because, you know, like if you have a deterministic case, if you stop here, you're forever going to be stopped. You're never going to be moving forward. But if you have a kind of stochastic sampling, then sometimes you move forward again after a while and complete the task. So this is important for a real robot rollout. And the final thing is really the code book size, which we found that for us, like 16 times 16 is mostly a sufficient number, but you could balance it out. Just larger code book size and more compute. Generally, we haven't found a negative impact. Smaller code book size can actually harm your model. Um, so that's more or less what we're going to be talking about. Yes. So this is the action bins. Or... Yes. Yes, this is the number of action bins. For for our smaller data set, we've only talked about single task models and not like a large multi-task, multi-robot model. So that might be different for different sizes of tasks. This is all for single task. All right. And with that, right, uh, we have talked a little bit more about how VK behavior transformer works. And now I'm going to be passing it on to Ross to talk a little bit more about diffusion policy. Thank you. Okay, so um, my goal here is to sort of do the comparable thing that Mahi did, but for diffusion policy. And um, I'll spend just a minute or two, you know, a couple slides only saying what diffusion is for the, in case anybody doesn't, hasn't studied that yet. Um, but I really want to spend most of the time telling you some of the tips and tricks and like what makes, you know, getting it to work on the real robot to the, to the best of my ability here. Uh, let me hide this. Okay, so um, you know, so diff the diffusion policy was actually uh, was Chung Chi when he was uh, he came as an intern at TRI and and has begun a, a great collaboration with uh, Sharon and and some of the folks at TRI. Uh, it's been really changed some of my perspectives on these things. So what is uh, diffusion? Uh, so Mahi talked about categorical distributions, and that was the classic way that we knew how to learn distributions at, at scale, and I think. The CVAE, apart from potentially kind of famous problems with mode collapse, gives you a way to do the continuous uh, learning continuous distributions. And diffusion is trying to do almost the same thing, uh, but it just seems to be more robust and more um, you know easier to train, uh, more effective in many ways. Okay, so the standard way uh, that people explain this is if you have an example, let's say if you're going to do diffusion for an image. Then what you do, it's very easy. You make uh, you make your training data by adding noise to an Im image until you get to Gaussian noise, just random pixels. And what you do is you use that as training data to learn the denoiser going the other way. Okay, so the the denoising process, when Mahi says, you know, we're going to do learning the distribution via denoising, is learning that reverse process. Okay. And it really is like the diffusion algorithm is kind of three steps. There's some details around it, but roughly you pick a random noise, you know, you generate your noisy data and you try to train with a squared loss to the denoiser to try to go the other direction. Okay, so you'll see people um, giving pictures. This is a very sort of uh, classic picture sort of, of how to think about diffusion. You're gonna take a sampling distribution, which is all Gaussian, and you're going to um, try to learn a mapping, which denoises, if you will, to the true probability distribution that you're trying to learn over a continuous space. Okay, and um, and you 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 train with some sort of simple loss in order to get sort of the this mapped denoise distribution to match the real data. There's actually another interpretation that I like very much, uh, just the deterministic interpretation. So uh, there's a nice blog post about this right here. Okay, um, imagine you just have a very simple Swiss roll data set. So these points are not trajectories, like any one, this is just points in a 2D space. Okay, and the one of the motivations, uh, sort of intuitions behind diffusion is that there's like a manifold hypothesis. So maybe natural images lie on a manifold and this data sort of clearly, there's some underlying manifold that generated the data. And if I sampled more, I'd sort of expect to still see things from the Swiss roll. And the, the question is, 
you know, how do we learn a model that sort of explains this, this manifold and can sample from that manifold. And what the process of taking a, a point here, adding noise to it, and then learning the vector field back, what you get is your denoiser, which is conditioned on the level of noise that you add, is, is learning basically the distance to the data and the vector field that's pointing you back to your data distribution. And there's some subtleties at the high data, it's actually going kind of towards the mean of the data um, distribution. But as you as you dial in closer to the um, to small noise levels, it's really just kind of projecting you back to that manifold, okay? I, I particularly like the deterministic interpretation because then it tells you, for instance, how do you, could, if you wanted to add constraints, when you're, you know, if you wanted to add new constraints, when you're doing basic gradient descent back to the manifold, you could, it's sort of easy to think about how to do that. If, if you think of this as doing gradient descent, you could do projected gradient descent to do constraints, for instance. Okay, so how do you map that very simple 2D picture into what we're learning in a in a behavior cloning sense, right? So this is the, the uh, example we talked about before, the push T that sort of, Famous now example that a lot of people use. <clears throat> okay, so the denoising is there's some demonstration trajectory for every uh, observation sort of state. Uh, there's some trajectory that the human took, or maybe a distribution of trajectories that the human took. We added noise to them to make them random trajectories, like literally the points in the trajectory are just random. They could be anything in the possible end effector space. And then the denoising process starts from just random points in, along the trajectory and denoises it back to a coherent trajectory that can be executed. Yes? What is the trajectory? The CTO of the end effector? Yeah, so typically we would have, like for the bimanual panda, it would be end effector positions. We've actually switched recently to velocities, you know, relative actions. Uh, but yes, think about it as, as that. In this case, it was just even the 3D pose of the end effector. In fact, this one is a circle, sorry, 2D pose of the end effector, yeah. Okay, so otherwise the architecture, so this sort of thing on the right is the denoiser that's kind of running around a loop to do that denoising and, and um, iterate back to the to the manifold. Otherwise, the architecture that you'll see in the diffusion policy paper looks a lot like what we've seen in uh, the other the other architectures we've studied. And it just like that was the thing that just started. I mean, we've been doing, you know, I told you that. Pete and Lucas sort of convinced me that visual motor was super good. We were trying a bunch of different things at TRI. We had a whole project called Intuitive Physics, and we tried Implicit BC a lot when that came out, and it was it didn't quite um, you know solve some of the harder problems. And then when Diffusion, we started using the Diffusion versions, it just was amazing how reliably we could train uh, these tasks. And at this point, we've trained. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of tasks uh, this way. It starts, you, you start running out of things that you can do with a bimanual robot on a, on a bench. We have uh, robot teachers that, you know, try to come up with clever new tasks. <clears throat> okay, so, um, you know, the things we look for. So, so just to, to say, so um, sometimes when people talk about behavior cloning, they think about relatively short prediction windows uh, and relatively short duration tasks. Uh, the tasks we've trained at TRI are typically relatively long duration. So when people ask about, you know, if you could sequence these into multiple steps, um, we often have tasks that are like one and a half seconds or something like this. And you will see that, first of all, you can knock the robot around. I already showed some examples of that. But we have these long horizon, multiple seconds, multiple step tasks. And those tasks exhibit like discrete branching logic. So you could like go in and perturb and maybe the robot was using its right hand to do something. And after the perturbation, it switches and uses its left hand. Or if it, you know, was kind of, was doing one task and, and then there's some perturbation, it'll actually just take a different path through the task in order to get it. So these were sort of signs that things started working well. Uh, I'll just show a couple of the slightly more recent ones. You can do the Ziploc bags. This is a pretty fine manipulation. You still see the, a little bit of pauses. Some of those, by the way, come from the human demonstrators too, when they're demonstrating with Space Mouse. Uh, we got to get rid of those. You know, uh, for people that have, are familiar with sort of depth cameras, you know, that's the clear bags are a nice little, you know, would have been hard to do that before. And this doesn't work every time. Sometimes it pitches the banana, but it's like, you know, it get, often gets the job done, I'd say you know, 80% or something like this for this test. Of course, yeah. Uh, 
I'll show the I'll show exactly, but in this in this setting, maybe we can see them. No, it's hard to see the cameras here. They're up on the pole here. There's normally two or three scene cameras, and then there's a bunch of wrist cameras. You see, there's one, two, three, four FLIR wrist cameras. Not, they're not depth. The, the, the scene cameras are RGBD, although we don't use the depth right now. Uh, and then the uh, there's a bunch of wrist cameras. Yep. And, and then we pass in the joint information too, but not torques. Yep. Yep. So that is, um, so exactly. So uh, we actually, for somewhat arbitrary reasons, we found that we predicting a, a, a horizon of 1.6 seconds. This is at 10 Hertz. It runs, the whole thing runs at 10 Hertz, but we make a 1.6 second prediction. We execute the first 0.8 and then we replan. I don't think those are magical numbers. They're the ones that started working and we kind of dialed it in and haven't explored a bunch more. Uh, Chung started doing uh, even more dynamic tasks with the, the Yumi. So for instance, he was throwing balls and stuff like this. And he did a, more work to try to, um, first of all, calibrate the delays in the system. These are things that I think controls folks know how to do. Uh, and then, you know, he he also proposed this sort of relative trajectory action. So thinking about, you know, velocities and also relatively subtle uh, change of variables sort of across, across the predicted trajectory. And at TRI, we have actually found that that's very successful across the wide range of our tasks. And we're primarily doing that now. And it's interesting, I was, I was saying to a few people that, uh, the gap between absolute actions and relative actions reared its head in uh, in sim pretty pretty dramatically. I think because it's um, maybe the joint angles are too perfect and it's too easy to sort of the causal confusion uh, you know uh, sort of problem is that it's too easy to sort of overfit to uh, to a perfect interpolation of your past joint angles to predict your next one. Uh, I think maybe if we had more noise, then the the absolute actions might work just as well. Yes, but the relative I mean here is in time. So you put your different delta actions instead of actions. Yeah. From the initial state, when we plan. Uh, Sorry? From the initial state, when, when we plan. That's right. That's right. So, so it's relative to the initial um, yeah, initial state. Mm -hmm. And the, the, each action is, is a, they're accumulated as you plan in this sort of strangely um yeah i mean i think you, if, if you work through the illustration you'll understand yeah. okay so here's sort of the standard training recipe that we've used since uh since we started working on diffusion policy okay um for a long time we we sort of we dialed in our hyperparameters at you know at at high cost maybe for at the first time and we fell into a routine where we basically knew for any new skill uh we would just train a fixed number of steps. 80K is the magic number that we tend to use, okay? We expect to see our training loss, which is the denoising loss. So the, your ability to predict the denoiser, uh, it drops very quickly, but we find that that is not predictive at all <laughs> of, the, of the action prediction loss. So we always, in you know, in 1DB, we, also, we always uh, also predict the the full action MSC, which means uh, this is on the validation set. So that means we're actually denoising multiple steps to get the trajectory out and comparing it to the trajectories in the data set on the whole held out validation. And this is the curve that sort of we watch more uh, and expect to see sort of some slightly better correlation with performance, although still we only believe uh, closed loop evaluation is a real predictor of, of good performance, not open loop evaluation. And here's the dirty laundry, right? The val loss, so if you just look at the denoising loss on the validation data set, it tends to look like that. And that, that's just, I don't know, I don't have a great explanation for that. I, I hate that. <laughs> um, I, it just feels like we're, we're not optimizing the core objective correctly. And uh, that seems very weird. So that's one, on my list of things to understand better. Uh, but it, but the, the recipe is solid, you know? Um, so fix this number of training steps. Uh, on hardware, we typically just take the last checkpoint and know that that's going to be pretty good. Occasionally, if we're like, it's an important demo or something like this, we might check a couple, we might, uh, when I say try the last checkpoint, that would mean take the, the model weights at the, you know, after 80K steps and go start evaluating it on the robot, make sure it's good. If it, um, every once in a while, we'll look back at the 70K or 75K or something like this and try a few more of the different models just to see if 
they happen to look better. But again, that is often in a relatively no, low number of experiments uh, regime. It, it was classically. And um, I, I think there's kind of a, a folk wisdom that some of you have and some of and C1 and others in labs certainly have where they kind of see the signs of a well-trained policy or an overbaked or an undertrained policy. But really we, you know, so so it doesn't mean so no longer is it the case that C1 or, or anybody has to train anybody specific has to train the policies. You can just, you know, I can go in, train ADK, take the last one and expect to have success on the robot. Yep. Oh, just just the number of, of iterations we run through the data. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I mean, we have certain batch size. It's all it's all dependent on batch. So the mapping from the, the traditional epochs, you know, passes through the data, and it depends on your batch size or whatever. But we actually basically independent of batch size, we've baked in ADK. Um, <clears throat> okay. So I showed you now that we have sim eval that we sort of trust with confidence intervals and the like. There's still, I think. Not all, there are some differences between training and SIM and, and, uh, and the properties in real. But now we just, we can more effectively check all of our checkpoints. You know, any, anything that's sort of a reasonable checkpoint, we can start rolling it out and get the performance. And, and we, can, we only started doing this fairly recently, putting all the tools together and having error bars and the like. But it, there was a kind of a, wow, it actually does fairly well earlier in the training than we realized, uh, at least in SIM. And it actually looks more like the Val Action MSC. Um, so I think probably we've been a little inefficient by just choosing ADK all the time. But we're going to keep exploring that. Just to say, there's lots of things. Like it's amazing how well it works, but there's lots to, to understand and dial in. I should say, sometimes the Val Action MSC goes up a little bit. We get a little knee in the Val Action MSC, which is disgusting. Uh, and sometimes the best model is after the Val Action MSC goes up. OK. Uh, yeah, Carl. Uh, sorry, this specific plot was actually sim data, sim rollouts. Yeah, so it's not. Uh, we could do that. Um, we haven't. Yeah, we haven't done that here, but we totally could do that. Yes, I mean, we do have a sort of a digital twin. I haven't made the plots for all the checkpoints um, done that way, but you're right. That's like a, to be honest, we did this. Uh, a day or two ago to make the, you know, so, so next week. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Very good. So, so he says, what if we, um, if we were to take data, you know, trained on real data and evaluate it in SIM, would we see similar characteristics? The training process is very robust. In the sense that I would take a collection, a data collect, uh, you know, set of data that came from a, a some robot teleoppers, and be very confident that I could run ADK steps, pull off the last checkpoint, and have something that would roll out. Yep, we've done it for hundreds and hundreds of skills, not experts. Okay, so we have this big data collect. Um, in in we we call it. So we have a TRI has a uh, an office near Stanford. Uh, and an office in Cambridge, it's the CAM data for this. Uh, again, it's a little bit longer horizon than a lot of data sets and often very sequential and multi-step. So how do we get good data? There's some you know, tricks of the trade, I guess, uh, or at least the way we do it. And we talked a little bit about distribution shift, dagger, okay. You should ask, like, why aren't we suffering from those problems in this, these rollouts? If I could just collect 200 demonstrations and, and not see that, you know, how did we get around this well-known fundamental problem in imitation learning. Uh, and maybe here's here's an answer, okay? Um, so you, de you have to provide data that helps with robustness. Uh, C1 likes to say it's art, not magic. You know, if you want it to recover, you have to show it examples of recovering, okay? That, and you also have to show it the, all the things you want it to be robust to in general. Sometimes you get lucky and it generalizes, or kind of the interpolation in feature space is more complicated, okay? But um, so you definitely like move all the objects around in the scene, you throw some distractors in, uh, you change the background, the view. You typically will try to go in and like mess with the system, make it fail even during the, the tele-operation demonstrations, okay? Oftentimes we'll do like an initial data collect with 100 demonstrations. 
Um, we tell people, for instance, like if, if, if a non-expert came in to do the demonstrations, they'd say, we'd just say, if you fail, keep going, don't stop. Like that's the best data, right? We want your failure data. We want to see how you recover from the failures, right? And even we say, try to fail. Like think about the ways that this might fail. Like what if you have, what if you dropped the thing, right? You know, just go ahead and intentionally drop the thing and show us picking it back up, right? So uh, we want to see the demonstrations of the recovery. And then we typically take those hundred demonstrations. We train the policy. We test the rollouts. If the performance is satisfactory, we're done. Uh, Okay, and oftentimes that is. Uh, <laughs> but if we see any obvious failures, then we just collect more demonstrations that were set up to sort of hold those showing the recovery and uh, throw it back in. And then we train the diffusion policy and all the data again, which is sort of takes a long time, which is why we call it batch dagger, you know, data set degradation. Yes. Just to clarify, so in this example, you said like drop the spoon or the object and pick it back up. Yeah. Do you then have some post processing step where you exclude the kind of wrong start or we don't we oh. um we don't do that right so Actually cool. um the philosophy has become all data is good data there's a <laughs> there was one day that we had an exception and someone's like I, I heard I just was walking by lab and and I, I heard someone say yeah definitely throw out that data I was like wait a second I thought all data was good data he said yeah we just fried the motor I'm like okay that that's bad data don't use that you know um so yeah, we fried a Jayco and uh, there you go. Uh, I think it's just, I mean, again, so I think it's very dependent on the complexity of the task, how many different uh, sort of scenarios you wanna be robust to, that's a total ballpark, but it, like for the, somehow for the complexity of the task, the duration of the task, whatever the variability in the task that we've kind of fallen into using at TRI, that seems to be a, a, sim, a good number. Yeah, I think Mahi's tasks, he uses less for instance, um, and you know, maybe maybe there's less very, you know, I think he's in the wild, but it does like maybe the task is doesn't need as many demonstrations. Please. Would you not find that it forces itself to fail on purpose and then continue the task? So it's not necessarily just failing by chance and then it no longer recover. But now you see in the rollouts, it's like purposely failing. Yeah. So we often do the perturbations by someone coming in and you know, with a not a hockey stick, but you know, a poker or something like that. That is probably preferred than actually like you know, telling the robot to throw it through the teleop interface. But we, yeah, just the honest truth is we don't go through and like flag data as like, or cut out little segments or anything like that. Yes. Yeah, so um, you were mentioning that you have collected um, this demonstration for hundreds of tasks. Um, can you comment if you also train on all of these tasks um, at the same time for one big policy or is it always like just 100 demos for one task? Next yeah, so last year, the diffusion policy story was single task. Mm -hmm. This year, large behavior model you know, story is all about multitask. And so we are very actively training on all of these using VLM backbones. This is the, the ongoing work, yep. And comparing against open VLA and all the things. Yes. <laughs> So the, the, the question, just to repeat it, is, um, I mean, if you have somehow the less optimal demonstrations in your data set, isn't that going to screw you up? Do you see diffusion policy somehow going to the word more natural ones? I think, um, okay, there is deep learning theory that makes me optimistic. I don't know if it's exactly representative of what's happening, but I think um, uh, there's reasons to be optimistic that if there's some sort of fundamental manifold in the data and there's some spurious, noisy ex exceptions, if the if the bulk of the data is sort of doing the right thing, then it actually learns. I mean, it, it can still achieve zero training loss. You know, you can have networks that basically learn a sine wave with little delta functions that explain the noise, for instance. Okay, um, and there's also evidence that uh, it's a well known for, for for decades that actually behavior cloning can outperform the demonstrators in some in some ways. Uh, Sham Kakati just wrote a paper about this for chess. Okay. But you could certainly, even for GPT, you could imagine like uh, GPT can do things that no one author can do, right? So somehow there's a ways that the behavior cloning can actually do better than the demonstrations, right? Which is a subtle thing. But um, 
I don't have a, you know, a, a theorem. It could be 10 people, 10 demonstrations. Uh, it tends to not be. We, we have, you know, one person locks in. They, they, I mean, it takes some creativity just to come up with a task we've never done before with a bimanual panda. Uh, you know, so they, they come in with their, like, towels and or vacuum cleaners or whatever, set it up and then jam a hundred demonstrations out. Uh, it's true. Like actually what Mahi said was, I, I think it's good to get different demonstrations from different people. You get even more variability. That could be a good thing. That's not what we've done here. Right. That's true. That's true. But even one person that makes mistakes a few times, you could imagine outperforming. Yes, please. That's the question. So the question is, do you have a skew towards the successful tasks? I guess um, my optimistic, maybe too romantic view is that somehow the random little ways you fail are diverse and, and whatever. They're not worth learning. The core manifold that you're trying to learn is actually the underlying behavior. And if you get enough data, then somehow the principles that it learns, you know, as you start to get the scale, are more the principles of successful execution as opposed to the one-off frames where you like, you know, intentionally open the group or something like that. I think, you know, most of the time we don't like intentionally drop things in the data. I guess I, I probably should be careful to not say. Yes, please. Uh, but you're still are you trying to fix the problem or are you trying to see what the diffusion models can actually do? And how the diffusion models compare to the statistical by their first in this case? The, thank you. So the, 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 the are the diffusion, um, models intentionally trying to address the multimodality i would say explicitly yes the, this was this you know the multimodality was a motivation a strong motivation for trying diffusion right so it is the ability to learn not just single continuous prediction like an ms uh, mle would would do sorry uh, 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 mlp would do but uh, but to actually be able to learn an entire distribution yes Hi, um do people ever correct um from the point of failure and provide demonstrations like from the exact moment when the robot fails? And are you also thinking of ways of simplifying the ability for demonstrators to diagnose the robot need? Great question. So I, I would love to have a more like human robot interaction sort of version of this. Um, in fact, we have some folks that are um, HRI experts at TRI that are starting to get excited about helping us with that kind of thing. I'd say what we're doing now, that's when I call it batch dagger, that's an admission that we're not doing the sort of interactive, like we don't have the policy run and the human help, right? Which would be kind of the teacher forcing kind of idea that was in dagger. We're instead watching how the policy fails, stop, try to set up similar situations that a, hu a purely human tally op can, can give additional data for. Yeah. <clears throat> Does a link uh, the successful the successful rollouts to the training set help? Uh, so I mean, uh, you can learn the policy, let it uh, do some like rollouts, add it to the training sets, and uh, does it help? Like how 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 much does it help? Yeah, I think the the question is how much diversity you're addressing, or whatever. If you're in my mind, if you're expanding the convex help hole, it it helps a lot. If you're adding stuff like you know that are similar to the other demonstrations, then it's less you know there's a there's diminishing returns. I think probably if you're. Uh... This is open, but I mean, like in your experience, does it help? Uh, uh, experience in this industry, I think it is obvious, but that is how I that's how we guide our experiments, right? Like if we've demonstrated that a few times, we don't need to demonstrate that again. And so I think we've dialed in sort. Of... Oh, it's Oh, I'm sorry. Maybe I need you to restate the question. So you're saying that. So the question is like, when you learn the policy first batch, then you can generate the new data with it. Yes. And take on the successful rollouts and add it to the training. Oh, 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 very good. So, so let me say that again. So, so do I use successful policy rollouts in our next wave of data collection? I see. Very good. Um, you know, that's exactly one of the. So we've not done that, uh, to my knowledge. I don't know of any experiments that has, have done that. Um, that's the kind of thing that sounds like it shouldn't work, but probably does work, you know, in ML. Like the, the, I mean, we see people doing that all the time, and it's it's successful, right? But um, that's a, it's a good idea. I, we've not done that. Yeah. Yes. 
um, how does it compare the Fusion model to other generative models? Um, does it maybe require less demonstrations or something? Yeah, so I think that that is the maybe the question of the day. I think the categorical distributions are like super easy to learn, super robust, very good. I think the CVAEs are capable of of, of capturing the multimodal distributions, but sometimes in practice suffer from mode collapse. And the diffusion line of work, I think, gave us new tools that reliably capture this multimodality and learn the distribution, the, the, the log, it's, you know, the score function, uh, uh, you know, without hyperparameter tuning on any given day. So it is in the class of popular diffusion of generative models, and it's the one that we've had the most success. There's there's flow matching. There's there's going to be other things that improve, and, and you know these these kind of things, but uh, uh, diffusion's the tool to, for today for us. Let me just continue a little bit just to make sure I, I get through. So let me just talk you through this this particular example. So this was that egg beater example that we we've done a few times. This was our first attempt at it. We trained a bunch. We took a bunch of demonstrations. Uh, tried to sort of do the rollouts and it was a little janky, like didn't work super well, but that was actually all the duration that we tried for. But, um, you know, having seen the rollouts for this, we looked and we realized we had done a bunch of things wrong. So first of all, you know, the stainless steel is like way too shiny. You're like seeing the robot in distracting, complicated ways. Uh, we, we ended up putting, you know, black handle, black, you know, things on, on over black mats. The camera here is actually on the wrong side of the wrist, you know, like the, you couldn't actually, once you grabbed the, the, the egg beater hand, you couldn't actually see it anymore with the camera. So, you know, we learned from that. We went back to the drawing board. Now we put the camera on the other side of the wrist. We took away the black mat. That was just a bad idea. We've got a less shiny bowl. We put a little helper, <laughs> uh, you know, sticker on the, on the, uh, on the handle there. That's getting better. Okay. Um, but we still saw some, uh, you know, some failures. So then we added, went in and added more and more recovery data. So now uh, we could do the similar task, but be robust to, to sort of moving bowls. You notice we also changed it to even a bright red uh, sticker on the handle. Okay. But this was sort of the process of, of making the task more doable, given the current sensors, collecting data that captured the, the behaviors that we wanted. This one we did more, this was one of our first where we went through more sort of early, you know, early symptoms. Of, we don't make those mistakes on the first try very often anymore, uh, but it's kind of interesting to see our, the thought process maybe. And then by the end, you know, things were, were actually pretty robust and, and working pretty well. Okay. Um, we talked about this one a little bit already. Someone says, how many demonstrations do I need to get a, you know, 99.99 success rate? I'll just say it quickly with a total cop out, you know, that's not the question I want to answer. Uh, someone should do that. Right. But, uh, but I, I want the common sense robustness from multitask first, and then we'll come back and like re-examine the robustness question with an entirely new capability, I think. Um, and here, let me just dirty laundry list here. Some of the things I want to understand better. So um, you know, why does the val loss go up? Uh, and even the val action MSC goes up a little bit like this just seems like something's wrong. Um, I found out, I, you know, this is super embarrassing. I was reading the code after the paper, you know, went out and and realized only then that we're actually denoising past actions and then throwing them away and returning the other. Uh, so like if it's time T, we're actually denoising actions in the past. Uh, C1 thinks it's not a big deal. I think it's probably, it, it seems pretty weird to me. I like, I can't wait to, to try to cut that out. Do you have a reason you like it? I wondered if it, okay, good. So he says it may help with the causal confusion stuff. And so this to be, but it, it also could not be, you know, observable given the observation history. And and so it could, I know it's not, it doesn't have to be causal, but it it could be that it's not a manifold anymore, roughly that, you know, that's not even a, a well-described distribution if you don't have enough information to know where you came from. So um, these are things that often the answer is, um, you know, this worked and we haven't really, had enough evaluation power to test all the different questions that we want to, to test. Um, I think, so we typically don't actually, so I say that they're autoregressive models, right? Where you should put your outputs from one step back in as inputs on the next step. That's what an LLM does. That's what any autoregressive model would do. We don't actually pass actions back in, in the standard diffusion policy code. 
And I think we get away with it by because our observations roughly can contain the information of our actions. But I think that's probably just an omission. We should probably add that because if you want like, you know, I, I like thinking about what happens if you take the same model and you boil it down and train it on a linear system, do you get like LKG out? And you don't unless you put the actions back. Um, in the diffusion policy paper, there was the CNN version and the transformer version, not of the sort of backbone, but of just in the denoiser. So you can use a UNET um, sort of style thing. The, the diffusion transformers that people use in video, for instance, you know, we had something kind of like that in the action space and it just never worked as well as expected. And I think, I think that should totally work. I think probably there's just something wrong there. Uh, of course, we want faster inference. There's a bunch of little things that we'd like to get. And now we finally, I think, so So my strategy, you know, I, I was asking a lot of questions about these things and feeling like we didn't have the tools to answer them. And so that's where we kind of stopped and said, let me just build up a more robust eval framework so that we can sort of ask them and, and make statistically strong uh, modifications. Yeah. So regarding the statement of the transformer, do you mean the original transformer architecture you proposed in the paper? Yes. Or even better ones? Of course, I would disagree with that, in my opinion, especially multitask setting. Transformer is significantly better to get like the goal and the states conditioning in there. Uh, so tell me more. Just the original architecture or would you even say for updated ones as well uh certainly for updated ones there's i think there's no question in the multitask that we're bringing a you know something between our deep our encoders and our uh you know into our representation layer and our denoising output that has a big transformer it could be a, a vlm model that, that that is definitely transformer the question is in the denoiser is there a transformer in the loop or is there a unit in the loop or what's the right thing there we proposed in the original D, you know diffusion policy paper both CNN and Transformer, and the Transformer never worked as well as I expected in that just a denoiser. Okay, sorry, maybe just to repeat, because I think the original design has some weaknesses. I think so. How the conditioning information is going into the Transformer. Yeah. So for example, using additional noise in the self attention works a lot better. And so with this kind of stuff, did you also test it or would you just say to the original? Sorry, this is, I guess, I think I'm agreeing with you completely. I think there's obvious things that we did wrong, with the original transformer architecture that should be easily remedied once we just have the, the power to make changes and in, in okay, thanks. Thank you. But I'd love to get your list if, if you like. Yeah. I want to ask about the validation part. Yep. Do you, do you go to the uh, do you go to the validation side and figure out which demo uh, demos are actually failing to figure out maybe they are really different from the the what you had in the training set. I don't know. That just wondering. Um so so I think there's like an active learning kind of component that I think uh, we do in the uh, artful way of a human looking at how it failed and trying to add new experiments with human intelligence. I would love to have a more principled like active experiment design saying we saw failures in this direction. These are the the rollouts that we should, you know, even just instruct the human do these things or whatever. But right now it's still human powered that part. Once we kind of improve some of the basics, then I think we should be doing all the other frills. Okay, I'll skip that last part. Um, good. I think we're going to go to the row. All right. Uh, thanks, everyone who is uh, still here after um, a couple of hours or actually more uh, of the tutorial. So in this last section, which I'll try to keep short, uh, we'll be looking at uh, a bunch of problems that practitioners face. Uh, I'll start with uh, a quick summary of what we have already seen, and then sort of go over some nitty gritty details that uh, maybe we have uh, glossed over a bit. Uh, and again, as, uh, as with the previous parts, feel free to ask questions. Uh, you should sort of view this more as an interactive uh, discussion of sorts rather than uh, a lecture. Okay, so um, in today's um, tutorial, we talked about a bunch of things. We started with uh, a lot of the core fundamentals of imitation. Uh, we looked at uh, what sort of new things it has enabled right now and all the sort of amazing demos we have seen. We then saw a bunch of sort of 
low level um, implementation details of these algorithms. We look at uh, MSC losses. We looked at uh, the behavior transformer architecture, uh, a diffusion architecture, and so on. Uh, we have looked at multimodality in, in uh, its various forms as well. And so with all of this, you may feel like, okay, I'm ready to go out there, train my robots, and you know everything's going to work well. Um, but is this really enough? Uh, probably not. There's a lot of uh, sort of uh, folk wisdom which is needed to make these things work. Um, Russ uh, has already mentioned a bunch of these for the diffusion kind of works. Um, and uh, he has also talked a little bit about it in the behavior transformer line of works. But these are, but all these insights are sort of very local to what we have seen. And in order to sort of uh, reduce a bit of this bias, what we did as as a, a part of the tutorial is we reached out to a bunch of um, a bunch of practitioners in the field. Uh, here are uh, a few of them over here who gave us really insightful comments and feedback. Um, Carl is actually over here. So if you have um, questions about the RT line of work or open ELA line of work, you should uh, uh, you should you should ask him after this. So after we received a bunch of feedback from a bunch of um, practitioners. What we did is organize a bunch of them and try to keep like, uh, or, or try to give like a summary of uh, what people feel are important uh, things when you try to train these SPL-like policies. Okay, so let's get started with a bunch of uh, tricks that that you should you should know about before you get started. The first one, which I think everyone we asked mentioned was to start in simulation so do not start on a real robot when you're when you're just getting started start in simulation there are a few reasons for this it's not just one main reason the the first main reason when you're starting out is to just understand the mechanics of training understand how the algorithms work how the code is supposed to be structured how many epochs to train it on right um, you know, so uh, let's give the example of training 80k on the real world. But maybe if you start in simulation, maybe you were, you know, maybe 20k is enough, right? So um, this this really helps you understand how to train it, and then when you move to the real world, it should help. Okay, so what should you start on? There are a bunch of um, options that people are using already. Uh, some people mentioned RoboMimic, some people mentioned Ebero, and now there is um, Le Robot, which we actually are um, in the tutorial, we're actually building on top of this. Um, TRI is, is coming up with uh, the LBM eval, and hopefully we can use that soon as well. Okay, the second reason is it helps you debug and transfer to the real world. So this is actually a sort of um, nuanced point so in all these previous simulations right these are not like your real robot probably does not look like this but the next step is you maybe look at your real robot create a simulation platform which looks very much like the real robot so for example in a bunch of the tri um, um, sim videos you saw a simulation which looks fairly close to what the real setup looks like so this is something which several folks have mentioned uh, is is crucial uh, so for example Chung has mentioned that having a consistent interface really helps in the sense that once you train something in simulation, you have a high confidence that when you transfer it into real, it will work well. Similarly, uh, Toru mentioned that uh, in terms of visualization and, ev and evaluation, it really helps to, again, transfer from sim to real. Okay, so, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this is this is a great question. So the question is, how close should the simulation be to the real? Ideally, as close as possible, because the closer it is, the closer the physics are, the closer the failure modes will uh, will will transfer. Uh, now, of course, it it really depends on your problem, right? So if you're trying to deal with, I don't know, um, the egg beater example, where there's actual you know egg simulating egg is really hard. Right, so so it really depends on trying to choose the right problem, maybe where it's easy to create a good simulation as well. Okay, um, the next point, uh, which was again mentioned by by almost everyone, is to have a good way to visualize your data. As a part of this tutorial, we are using the Lay Robot um, visualizations. So if you are uh, looking at our code base, or if you are going to um, 
on this as you follow along with the recording. Uh, there is a native um, visualization over there. But in general, uh, even if you're not following this tutorial, it's, it's really important to have good uh, visualizations of your data. So um, one option for this is rerun.io, which we use fairly often at our lab. And I think uh, TRI folks also use it a little bit. Um, and at least from what we have seen is that it helps us catch bugs in the data processing, right? So if you're doing things like open loop replay, the video you saw was sort of adapted from the rerun.io uh, style videos. Okay, questions? All right, um, and again, like, um, this is something which was mentioned fairly often as well. For example, uh, Ed Shao mentioned that uh, when he um, visualizes his data, he takes 25 episodes or the order of 25 episodes from the data set and just like looks at the replay, right? So this is, uh, you know, this is, this is something which is important because from this replay, you can actually, you know, catch what types of mistakes uh, a teleoperator is making or try to, catch, for instance, okay, maybe um, the the color of the object looks very similar to the background, right? So just visualizing this data helps you sort of, uh, you know, uh, have a premonition of what, what a policy uh, would see. Uh, and similarly, um, Ifeng mentioned that uh, the failure videos especially are really important uh, because you can, you can actually get uh, retrying data from those failures. So, so again, uh, you know, if you if you have a good way to organize the failures as well, um, it would it would help you quite a bit. Okay, okay. The 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 next thing which is called eval eval eval. This is actually coined by uh, by Carl over there, and I, I really like it. So I'm just putting it over here, front and center. Um, so evaling is is hard, right? Uh, this is a you know we are we are trying to make things work on a real robot. Uh, you can start by evaluating things uh, in the simulation. And so, so that's how you should start. Try it out in simulation. Make sure things are working okay over there. One thing, once things are working well in simulation, well, then you can train on the robot. Look at the training losses. Look at the validation losses. Uh, and then, you know, from that point, you, you, you can feel a little bit, you know, uh, confident that it may work. Um, but, you know, it, it may not always work as well. So at this point, uh, for instance, um, Shikhar, uh, the way he does it is that he has an IPython uh, notebook. And in this notebook, he trains everything one by one in small steps, right? So he can see exactly what's happening uh, step by step, look at the eval losses, look at the training, look at the validation losses, see what examples are failing, see what examples are succeeding. Okay, so after this, you'll be like, okay, now I can actually run the robot. Um, and this is actually really important uh, because if you only look at the validation losses, you may you may over-index on what is happening. So as uh, Chung is saying over here, sometimes you will see that the validation loss is low, but it doesn't really correlate with what the robot is doing. And sometimes vice versa as well. Um, as Russ showed, sometimes you see the validation loss going up and there's some, you know, if it goes up too high, maybe it's not good, but a little bit of high is sometimes okay, right? Now, how do you actually know this? Well, this is why we need more research and uh, it'll be great if, uh, if folks here, you know, uh, try to solve or, or try to understand this problem. Okay, so the only way to know that your policy actually works is to run it on the robot. Without running this on the robot, Everything else is more like a, uh, it's like a vibe. You know, you, you have a good vibe, but the only time you know it actually works is when you actually run it on the robot and you see that it works, right? Um, so uh, uh, on this point, Carl mentioned that there are no good proxies. Like everything else is sort of like a vibe in some sense. Um, and and so the, the only way you can actually know that something works is to run it. So... Over here, there are a few thoughts as well. So it means that you have to have a framework where it's easy to run lots of experiments, right? So if you're in a lab, you want to create a consistent framework in, in terms of how you run these experiments. You want to have a way in which maybe if you're 
comparing a baseline with your algorithm, you may want to have a randomized trial, for instance, where it randomly chooses um, which policy to run, right? So just creating an infrastructure where it's very quick and easy to swap out uh, a different policy is going to be very helpful. Okay, um, any questions at this point? All right, so you, you have done all of this, you know, um, you, have, you have taken all that you have learned over here and, if, uh, and you try it out, your policy still doesn't work, what should you do? Okay, so the way um, I like to debug it and also sort of uh, in line with, uh, with what a lot of practitioners has mentioned, I'm sort of going to go step by step in the order of what you should do if your policy is not working. So the first thing you do is you run an open loop policy. So as he mentioned, you take your actions, take a start state, just roll out your actions from the beginning and see what happens, right? If your actions, if the behavior is just random, it means that maybe your data set is wrong. Maybe the way you have saved your, uh, saved your actions is wrong, right? And again, if you can visualize this data on the robot or in simulation, this can give a further uh, information of what's happening in your data set. Yeah. Camera's upside down. Oh, okay. I thought you said my camera. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, the next one is to start simple. So what this means is that um, instead of trying to solve a super long horizon, super precise, multi-fingered dexterity task, start with a task which is fairly simple. A task which you think that even a simple model should be able to learn, right? So for example, Carl mentioned that uh, you should start with a small data set, either in real or in sim, uh, something where you you know you, you know for sure it should work, right? And so once you make that work, it gives you a verification that your setup is correct. It gives you some sort of you know it, it gives you some sort of uh, uh, a baseline infrastructure where you know that at least the at least the building blocks are fine, right? Um, something which I uh, uh, which I liked how it was framed is what uh, is what Ed mentioned is um, you, you know if you're trying to solve a hard problem and it's not working you keep reducing the problem into a simpler and simpler form until it works right and even in in the simplest form it's not working it means that something is really fundamentally wrong in your framework right so start with you know sure start with the hard problem but try to break it down into a simpler part until it starts working okay. The other one, uh, the the other um, feedback over here is uh, apart from just um, uh, starting simple, you also should start small. So instead of starting with I don't know like a hundred million parameter model, uh, start with a small neural network, right? Because you have small amounts of data. Start with a small network. Um, Sidan, for instance, has seen that for for the simple problems, especially simple architectures and small policies are often fine, right? So it's good to start on these simple state-based uh, um, state based models with, uh, you know, uh, with, with all the algorithms you have seen over here, and then move on to sort of larger image-based uh, models. Okay, any questions? All right, okay. Um, one, one aspect which I thought was really interesting, especially if you look at um, highly agile, or dynamic behaviors uh, is system latency, right? So at the end of the day, we want these things to work on real robots. Real robots have real systems, real components in them. And I think as uh, Chung said really well, uh, the real world is not a gym environment. The world does not stop when your policy is running, right? So uh, all the different components of your robot, your sensors, your actuators, are giving you information at different frequencies, at different rates, at different um, amounts of delay, right? So if your if your policy is not working, it could be because of this, especially for a more agile and dexterous task. Okay, so um, one of the last points is to pay attention to your data. This was mentioned throughout um, this tutorial, where the type of data you have really affects the models that you train on top of this data, right? So there are several tricks over here. So, so uh, a few of the tricks that um, that Mahi and Russ had mentioned is to have failure data, to start from diverse initializations, 
to maybe perturb the environment as uh, as a teleoperator is collecting data or maybe you can train a policy run the policy for some amount and then ask a teleoperator to then come in and show more data right uh, so for example um, you mentioned that uh, if you if you have to collect a large amount of data you should probably try to pr uh, you should probably try to prioritize the diversity of data more than just the raw numbers of data so there was a question uh, in the audience uh, uh, a few sessions ago about is it better to have uh, a thousand demos for one task or to have uh, a thousand tasks with a few demos each so so i think uh, the sort of analogy over here is uh, you want to have if you if you have a budget of uh, data collection you want to spread out as much to what setting you would see in your evaluation right okay so so with that here are again um, uh, all the people uh, who gave who gave this feedback really thankful to to all of them uh, and and then just as a concluding last slide, um, uh, and then after that we can we can take more questions as well. Uh, I want to thank a few people. So uh, first of all, RSS for having this wonderful um, conference and the venue, and for having us uh, take this space to present. Uh, TRI for actually collecting a lot of uh, a lot of the demos, which will be a part uh, of the sim benchmark, and also on the um, later bought um, um, repo, which is also released alongside the tutorial. And then I want to also thank all the other organizers, Mahi, Siwan, and Russ, uh, for their amazing work on this tutorial. So with that, I will end, and uh, I'll take any questions here. Questions? Yeah. Is there anything going on between? Uh, do we do anything between like the policy evaluations and sending it to whatever low level controller you have? You mentioned delayed functionalization, but maybe there's some like splining or evaluation. Yeah. yeah. So there are there are actually a bunch of things that you can do. It's based on the type of problem you have. It's also based on the on the sort of uh, controller you have because some of these controllers do automatic splining, for instance. And so knowing what type of uh, spline method they are using uh, helps quite a bit. Um, so in a, in a lot of our work, uh, we actually just try to ignore this problem and run things in a quasi-static way. So it's like, okay, we could run the task a little, uh, a little faster if we take care of the latencies and the delay. But I think the stage of research we are in right now we want to see something work at a very high level of robustness first, and then transfer to a uh, and then transfer to a setting where we can run it at much higher speeds. Yeah. So, so I would say that if you are starting out, maybe uh, don't worry about this problem too much. Look at a quasi-static sort of problem where the where the dynamics and latencies don't matter too much, and just run run everything at a slower pace. Right. Just like you know, if there's if there's a time delay, just just wait for the information to come. Yeah. Okay, so maybe maybe we can we can end now, and uh, I'll be around. So if you want to ask questions, feel free to feel free to catch me. Yeah. All right, thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you.